morning. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you for being here for this work session this morning, and I appreciate everybody uh, again being here. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, Clerk, we have a public comment. Yes, we have one citizen who signed up, Mr. Pierce. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Larry Pierce, if you could come forth, and Mr. Pierce, you know the rules. Uh, we just want to keep it civil, and you have a three-minute rule. If you could state your name for me and um, give us your address for the record. I would appreciate it, and the subject matter this morning is the Labor Day Parade to the corner. Okay, got you. Larry Pierce, <clears throat> 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I, had to, I was at the river yesterday and I think my ears got too much Chattahoochee River in it. <clears throat> it was a disaster, I'll tell you that, yesterday. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> there's two things today. And you know, I really actually enjoy coming up here. It's kind of therapy. I'm getting away some of the things that I'm presently working on a new invention. But I would like to put some rumors aside by, uh, we all kind of know what's going on as far as in the courthouse. <clears throat> now, to make sure you all understand the law, the grand jury is appointed by a judge, and it's secret. By secret, I mean when it's an investigative body. Otherwise, it's not. And there's nobody that knows what's going on. Nobody can tell. Nobody can talk. There's not a transcript. You can't be forced to testify. And anything you say cannot ever be held against you because it's to bring forth things that the country, our <coughs> United States, was founded on. And it is truth to be investigated by the grand jury that was set up by the king in England years ago. Now, it is not easy to get certain things. You gotta know what to ask for. So if anybody wants to know what's going on, this public information, this is not in the record. This is called the minutes. Didn't know what it was until a year ago. Minutes is something the judge writes, and this is in recorded book. 60, page 135, and it cost me $6, it's 12 pages, and basically it's an outline of what the judge expects the grand jury to do, okay? Now, that's just for your information. The parade was fun on Labor Day, and actually I got a lot of humor out of it, because I saw Miss Godwin on a horse, and as the program said, a horse is a horse is a horse. Well. It's amazing to me that she has a handicap sticker and she was on a horse. She wasn't controlling the horse. Willie Watkins had somebody walking it and she was just sitting up on top of it. So you might have some disability of some sort, but you're not afraid to ride a 1,500 pound animal. Well, for a little bit of humor, Horse's ears about that long, right here. And other animals' ears are about that long. And I'm not sure which one she was on. So, that's my humor for the day. But, like I say, if you want to know what's going on, you can't find it. You have to know what to ask for, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce, for taking this matter under advisement. Uh, under advisement for the commissioner. Thank you. Vice Chairman. Yes, Robert thank you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, to, to, just to my peers, and you know, we appreciate our friends of the county and, and neighbors uh, accordingly. One of the things I, I it's always important uh, when we balance, uh, when we talk about what, uh, we talk about our founding values, and we, we, we talk about how things evolve over time. We have citizens um, and differences. Um, and within our laws, uh, there's something about discrimination, whether it's gender, whether it's disability. Uh, and there's a very thin line between 
what's real and what's not, and how uh, perhaps uh, opinions are <coughs> imposed on the whole. And you know, when I, you guys know me, when, when I hear uh, comments that they bully, um, it, it's important that that be defended. It's not someone's place to judge what a person can and cannot do, uh, especially when the law comes to play. So we're being challenged to say, well, can a person do something because they have a disability? And I'd like to, I mean, it's something that we could take up, but I think that, you know, you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of that argument um, and being able to execute your job with a disability. Now, the mockery that occurs um, against our, our fellow peers, uh, I, I, again, I'll leave that alone, let that stay the First Amendment, will allow society as a whole to judge those things. But there are some protections, federal protections, against disability, against those gender. Some of the comments that we hear through public comments, <coughs> I sit here and I just, ooh, really? Huh. So, I, you know, to those who have gender sensitivity, disability sensitivities, you go down the whole line of, of things that are found in sort of the EEOC, Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment. Um, go look at some of those acts. And we as a government must ensure that we comply with those things um, and, and that we understand what they mean. So as we hear comments, we understand where the line is. So I'm going to, I think I did that in less than two minutes, but I just want to put that out to my peers as we hear this, if y'all want to take this up for consideration. I'll be glad to join you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Robinson. We're going to move on. Um, or commissioners, I just wanted to, uh, I'm trying to expedite this meeting. I you know it's a pretty lengthy meeting, so I'm just trying to keep us on task. Um, approval of the minutes. Uh, be prepared tomorrow, Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. to, uh, please, if you would review the minutes and be prepared to approve uh, accordingly tomorrow. Then we have the proclamations. We have the proclamation proclaiming the week of September 17th through 23rd as uh, Constitution, uh, Constitution Week in Douglas County. And that will be read by Ms. Sue College in tomorrow. So be prepared for that as well. And then also be, uh, for our approval of the minutes tomorrow, uh, tab number 14, 15, 16, and 17, uh, be prepared to approve those accordingly as well. We will move back to our presentation. We have a slot presentation. This is uh, Terry Gable. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Terry Gable. I'm in Moreland Altabelli, and I'll be doing the splice update uh, for September. David Good to do a quick uh, update on the vendors uh, following, uh, following the, the SPLOST update. So for this, um, this month we're doing the July, reporting on the July revenues and work through our invoice through August. Um, we're approaching right at $28 million at uh, the amount of money that's been invoiced. Um, the majority of that came out of transportation this month. Uh, fire and EMS stayed basically about the same around $14 million. Transportation's up close to $9 million that we've invoiced to date. And then parks and recs went, went up some, they are right at $2.4 million is where we're currently standing. So right at $28 million uh, to date through August that's invoiced. <clears throat> Uh, some continued good news with the, the revenues. We were just under $2.4 million for July. So hopefully the economy will stay solid and we'll continue to get these good good numbers going through, at least uh, uh, for the foreseeable future through year three, which will end March and March 31st. So we're about the 28th month uh, of the program overall. So we just, as long as we keep it above that graph, uh, we should be in good shape. <coughs> Uh, just to give you some quick totals for um, SPLOS year three, there's the hard numbers for the, the revenues that came in. Uh, if you compare that to what was uh, projected for year three, we're just under a million dollars uh, <coughs> overage for year three. And then looking at the whole program in general, um, we're even showing a better overage with that, with uh, about $2.2 million comparing the, the full 28 month, uh, the revenues versus the projections. So good news there, and we'll 
<coughs> we'll truck him with those numbers and see how, they, how the economy does over the next <coughs> year. And then just a quick report on the, the bond service and payment obligations. Uh, we'll make that first payment in October 1st uh, for the payback this year, and then the larger one will be in April of 2020. So with that, we'll, we'll jump in and do some quick updates on the projects. The list of the projects that have been completed up to this point and fire. So the countywide uh, digital radio system uh, still progressing along. Obviously, we're still waiting on FCC's final approval on the agreement uh, with that south, that south tower. Um, so Motorola's waiting cautiously and trying to move forward with some work on it. Outside of that, we're doing user, they're doing user training and moving forward with finishing up equipment. Uh, we're still working towards the end of the year for them to, to go live with the system. And like we reported last month, We'll do the, the final testing will have to be in the spring of next year when the foliage is back on the trees to get the, the true numbers of when they do the final test. The, uh, the one amulets that was on order, we're still waiting on that. No updates on that. It'll right now schedule to be in in October. <coughs> And the fire truck is, is in fabrication or will start soon. Uh, everything's set to go there. The chief of them had a pre-bed meeting on it. Um, they've got the, the specs for it and they're moving forward with getting a schedule um, set up and we'll start that soon. Station three, we're just hanging on here trying to get that, the final few things done. That was uh, the contractor had to come back in and do some warranty work uh, for the chief. But the, that schedule for next week, and we'll we'll move this one to um, to com another completed project. <coughs> and then last, with the uh, the vehicles in fire, there were three vehicles total for the year. Two of them have been delivered. Still, uh, I think add some equipment to one of them. Uh, and then the chief and I'm going to step back and look at the budget and see what's what's remaining in the the budget for equipments for this year, and then decide on on what the next purchase will be. So with that, we'll move into transportation. Projects that are completed. Uh, the resurfacing, pro resurfacing program, which includes your Sploss Roads and the LMIG, uh, is ongoing. C.W. Matthews is, is in Douglas County. Uh, Miguel tells me they've moved out a couple times, but <coughs> The work should be no problem for, for CW to finish the work this year as scheduled. And they, they're moving forward with, uh, with the resurfacing program. The payment evaluations, um, we'll be doing a, a presentation to the uh, transportation <coughs> committee tomorrow too. Just an overview, kind of uh, bring everyone up to, to where we're currently at with it. Um, and then what will be the, the last things remaining for uh, Moreland to do in working with the Miguel staff as far as training and turning over the license to them. So everything's basically ready. The, the, uh, the spreadsheets there, uh, we'll have uh, those will be provided uh, to the board for, for you too. And moving into the intersections, uh, Stuart, Stuart Mill Road at Reynolds Road, um, the right of way is ongoing here. There's eight, um, eight or nine parcels that are having to be acquired. Easements are, are right of way. Uh, the plans are being submitted this week. If uh, Miguel doesn't already have them, these are final plans for uh, review and comments to get back to the to Jacobs. So we're, we're getting close with this. It, it'll boil down to the right of way and, and, and how long it takes uh, to get those parcels acquired. Uh, Bright Star and John West, uh, the right of way is, is complete on this. We're finishing up a small amount of utility coordination and it, it'll be ready to let. Um, this will be the next one outside of the one we just currently got let um, at Sweetwater. This will be the next one that'll go to construction. And then speaking of Sweetwater, Church Road and Doris Road, um, that project was let. It's on the agenda. Uh, for the board's approval for the for the low bid, 
once that's done, and uh, there'll be a notice to proceed issue and the contract can start work. And then Chapel Hill Road, our larger intersection project design still ongoing here. Um, utility coordination has started, so everything's progressing. Uh, and we're on track uh, with everything up to this point with, with Chapel Hill. Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard. Um, this will be the design. I'll start on this once we get final uh, task order signed uh, with the on-call uh, consultant. They'll start the design for this and then we'll move into right-of-way and utilities. Post Road Bridge, no, no change there. Uh, Miguel still has one parcel to acquire there. It's a small amount of right-of-way, but he is having some, some issues We're working through that. Hopefully with the timing of that versus the, when the contractor is ready to come into Douglas County, the GDOT contractor, will um, everything will be done and we'll be ready to go, set, go work on that one. Our three uh, sidewalk projects, the first two, Lithia Springs and Chestnut Log, are in, um, in the right-of-way phase. Miguel's telling me that uh, we're making good progress with the school. There's a school at Lithia Springs uh, that we're having to get some, some, some right-of-way for. But both of those are moving very well. It should, should be a fairly quick turnaround on the right-of-way. There was only just a few parcels that we needed to get. And then the remaining uh, sidewalk project is at the high school. And GDOT has that application for permit uh, and was reviewing it. Once we get that back, there was no right-of-way that was needed on, on the high school, at the high school. It was just, once we get the permit in, we'll be ready to let that project. So a lot going on and a lot of things getting ready to, to get out on the street. Um, just a real quick update on Whitestone Culvert. Uh, Miguel had the pre-construction meeting. It was held. Notice to proceed has been given to the contractor and work to start, uh, hopefully within either this week or next week. Um, and we'll see some actual work going on out there to get that culvert, badly needed culvert replaced. Our street lights, uh, we've gotten approval on the, uh, the first project, which was the lights at the interchange on 20. Um, my understanding that GDOT's got to review that. Um, review the, the plans for it. Once that's completed, um, George Power and Grace Duncan set a schedule and then we'll, we'll move forward with that. The Highway 92 project, again, has been, um, GDOT has agreed to do a quick response project on that and we're just letting let that work itself out there. This, it's in the design phase and should start um, within uh, right now. Well, that's Miguel's last comments with him that that project was probably going to be moved, uh, could be moved to the first of the year uh, as far as the start time. Well, we'll keep you updated as GDOT updates us on their progress. And then Highway 92 at Riverside Parkway, this will be another project that will be assigned to an on-call consultant. Um, once we get that going, we'll get the design started and start developing the scope for it. And then the Lee Road widening project. Again, this is a, the larger project uh, that we're partnering with GDOT on. And if you remember, uh, Michael Baker has been uh, approved to do the design for that and it's really just bringing the plans up to date uh, and then trying to get the, the construction schedule worked out for, for the future once that's done and the funding. This Maxim Road, um, so the authorization for the construction funding agreement with GDOT is on the agenda. Uh, once that's done, and Miguel can get approval from GDOT to start this project. We'll That'll, it'll move into construction. Another project that's going to be started very soon. And with that, that wraps up transportation and we'll quickly go through parts. This completed projects. The Deer Lake Park tennis courts will be advertised this week. Um, once we get that, we can get some hard numbers on the budget. 
and we'll step back and, and look at the where we're at with that project in parks and, and see how we make some decisions on moving forward with some of the other projects. And the same thing with uh, the multi-purpose rec center and also the senior center. Uh, Bill will have all three of these projects will be advertised this week. Um, we'll have that on the street um, and be looking for the bids to come in. And then the last two here is Bill Art and Fair Play. These, these concession buildings have been let out. We have the bids in and we're holding on to those. As I mentioned earlier with Deer Lick the setbacks, once these hard numbers come in, we make some uh, uh, decisions on moving forward with, uh, with projects based on the budget. And then finally with uh, Gary's equipment, I think we've got a small amount of money here to try to decide what he wants to uh, use, but uh, close to wrapping that up for the year. And with that, I'll take any questions the board has before David comes up. Okay, thank you so much, um, Mr. Gamble. Um, any questions from the board commissioners at this time? Vice Chairman Ross. Couple, couple questions. Um, Maxim Road, um, it's, um, that's when we, it's on the agenda. The Maxim Road, the Maxim Road um, sidewalk, right? Um, is a project. Uh, how long do we think that will take to be to be completed? That's my so the the project, the Maxim Road project, is the is the G dot intersection project. Yeah. Um, is there a sidewalk? There's a sidewalk in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's sidewalk, but not not the sidewalk project. Not, right. sidewalk. not confuse it with the. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You know what I mean. Yeah, it, it, it includes uh, sidewalks on both sides of Maxim Road from Thornton Road up probably about a thousand feet or so. Um, that's the GDOT project. Correct. Then there is a gap from there to the Cobb County line. Right. That is one of the projects that is we have an on call consultant that was assigned as a task order once the, once the uh, documents are signed. Understood. Thank you. I'm good on that. So, again, the intersection is something that should, this was an important intersection. Obviously, um, uh, there have been uh, casualties. This is one of the most dangerous intersections, uh, probably west of, it, uh, of Atlanta. This is something that we've been monitoring for quite some time. Uh, and so I'm encouraged to see this moving forward. Um, obviously, this is something that we work with our colleagues over, um, over in Cobb County. Um, you know, uh, obviously, their, their district obviously feeds into um, ours. I'm going to I-20. So this was an important project. I'm just glad to see it moving forward. Um, uh, Lee Road. Um, Lee Road is moving <coughs> forward. Your comment was that we're waiting for the state to approve. Say that again, just so the, the Lee see. Road widening project. Yeah. It's Michael Baker has been hired to update the plans. Yeah. <coughs> and that's that's where we're at with that project currently is is they're moving forward with updating the plans yep. to finalize those and to work out any environmental up, uh, revisions that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And then it moves from there. Okay. So um, I, I think, and again, we'll probably pick this up in transportation, so there's more of me just setting what I'll be going tomorrow. But in essence, um, I think that project was, what, April of next year, supposed to be starting construction. We're, we're just trying to level set the community, right? It's always, yes. that's important. All right, so if April, it's been stated, and I think I saw it somewhere, that April, perhaps March or April of next year, that project will begin. Do we think that this uh, Michael Baker's um, uh, um, work will be done in time <coughs> to meet that schedule? I mean, what's currently being out there? Or help, help me understand. Uh, yeah, Commissioner, the, the date of April uh, of next year is when the project is supposed to be advertised. Okay. Now, the process, as you know, uh, is prolonged uh, whenever the feds are involved. So it's going to be several months. Let's say that we advertise it in uh, April. Okay. It's going to be at least a month for bids to come back in. We're going to go through committee, 
it'll get here perhaps sometime in late May, uh, second meeting of May, uh, early June. Then once the board approves at this level, it has to be referred back to GDOT and they send it to Federal Highway. Yeah. So there's going to be several months time period for the for their review. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back here with a funding contract, very similar to what's on the agenda uh, today yep. or maybe nice. tomorrow, as it relates to Max <coughs> Park. So from from the bid date, there's probably five to six months of procedural administrative stuff that happens yep. before you actually would award a contract for construction. Okay. So if any construction, um, if we let the contract, if we advertise in April, we wouldn't be looking at any physical construction until very late in the year. Okay. All right, and, and that's right. So we're looking at November, give or take. So, but part of part, of, and thank you, Miguel. You're good. I, I, I'm just framing something. Uh, you know, I'm going to not believe my comments, and I'm still going to push on account of the administration by a, a, a reforecast of projects. Um, we're, we're, we're out here right now. We're in the season where we're communicating in various meetings, town halls. Uh, we've got a September Saturday coming up. And we're setting the public's expectation on when things are going to occur. Um, we had an original baseline schedule, and things, they changed. I mean, staff is just able to, you know, for whatever reason, I don't have enough staff. I can't, I can't fulfill what we originally laid out as it relates to a schedule. In other words, we laid out a schedule. Staff had to get in there, and, and, and based on reality, they have to type stuff up. It's got to go to this part and that part. And the reality is, is that perhaps they're not quite aligned. But we have an original baseline on when things are going to hit. And I'm looking at this, and I'm, I want to make sure I understand the reality because, well, years four and five are going to be tight or lean. And we're making decisions based on information, intelligence that staff provides us. And I just want to make sure we're clear. I'm not going anywhere with this, but you guys have asked for a reforecast. I expect to see it today at 2 o'clock at the Finance Committee. I mean, I, I haven't heard otherwise. And I was told last week. Yes. So we have moved. We have a special call finance meeting for that portion tomorrow morning at 8.30. Okay. So I'd like to know that. The reason we had to move it, I've got you know I have to go to this afternoon. So we're fine. That's more right than that. Yeah. And well, well, again, so... Um, we need this information. Um, there's some concerns, uh, at least from my office, on where we are. Uh, um, not in a bad sense, but for lack of, I've got an operational budget that's managed by finance. I have a SPLOS budget that's managed by program managers. And I've got administration to pull the balance too to give me a single view of the program, of, of where things are. We're making decisions based on <laughs> intelligence. Right? And, and so right now, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sort of like, okay, guys, there's a lot of moving parts. So we just get to reforecast so we can better understand where things are. I've heard a couple of dates on when things are coming, come and go. And see, one, more, we'll come, one person will say something, and somebody else will come up and say, well, no, this is really this. And it's like, okay, guys, what's truth? Right? And everybody's got ownership in it. I appreciate that. So not. This is not a criticism. This is constructive. Like, can we get a single view of what things are based on choices that we made? The Board of Commissioners takes responsibility for it. Well, the guidance that we give, um, no doubt. But I'm, I'm looking for like, okay, so when are these buildings coming online? When will these things happen so that we can communicate effectively? How is the cash flow going to come against that? How does that impact my general fund? That's what we're looking for. So, County Administrator, you said we're going to be able to have this information soon. How about this week? Sometime this week, we'll have tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to frame that. So that's part of a. Um, I won't say as much later on during the committee um, updates, but this is important because the SPLOST is something that we're all excited about. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of efforts by staff members to get this out here. The public has been waiting. We just want to make sure that we're. We're setting expectations on when they're going to come to pass. And so when we hear that, you know, perhaps we're behind or we're off track, we need to know the truth. We as commissioners need to know the truth on where things really are so we can set the public's expectations. And sometimes rumors, innuendo, uh, propaganda gets set forth 
Um, like we said, we, we want to make sure we understand the truth. So, Madam Chair, I just ask that we, as soon as we can. That's all I need. Everything else is fine. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. You're good. Thank you. Okay. I think we all know that government moves so slowly. <laughs> we have to talk about an issue for about uh, a decade or two before we actually see something going, uh, <coughs> dirt being moved. Uh, let's go back to the Reynolds, uh, the Stewart Mill Reynolds intersection that uh, Commissioner Carson and I share. She's got one side of the road, I got the other side. <laughs> uh, would you go over that part again? Because I forgot to even talk about that when we met earlier this morning. So. Um, so the, the good news is, and it was critical to get, it, get the Gale staff the right-of-way plans as soon as we were able to do that. And Jacob's got it to that point, and they're working on it right away. Like I said, eight or nine parcels, mm -hmm. thereabouts. Um, and get that critical part of it done, and then we can move into final plans and, and, and get everything, um, as far as utilities and everything coordinated, and getting that set, and then um, go to construction. This so will currently where we're at right now is right away phase and moving through that. So, uh, but we do have the design, yes, and the, we've already got the design completed, it's under review, it'll be under review, the final plans for it. Okay, and is there any kind of estimated time uh, of uh, bidding this job out? You tell me as far as the construction time. Yes. The length of time it take to bid to bid out the construction part of it, yes. Well, to bid it, to go through the bid process is what Miguel was leading to earlier. It's about a two month. I mean, from the time we. No. When will we be able to bid it out? To bid it out. In the spring. In the spring, based okay, on sure. estimates on right of way and how long Miguel's estimating right of way to take. Because as Commissioner uh, Robinson was talking about the dangerous intersections, that's a very dangerous intersection. Sure. And uh, it prohibits the flow of traffic tremendously in that area, and that's a cut through road. It's very heavily traveled. But uh, just pulling out sometimes from Reynolds Road, you're taking your life in your own hands, especially in the mornings or in the uh, afternoons. But um, that was a 2002, that was supposed to have been done with the 2002 oh, So these people, especially in the uh, <coughs> Chapel Hill sub subdivision up through there, uh, this is uh, critical for them. And we've had a lot of, uh, when we were going through the splash town halls and everything, that was brought up uh, several times. So uh, uh, I hope we can push this as fast as we can. We don't have DOT to work with. So it's just us. It's just us. That we don't have that layer of government that we deal with. Correct. So uh, I'd like to see this move as fast as possible. With that, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much. <coughs> Mitchell? Yes, sir. Just, just a couple more to go back to, but uh, just one thing. So the re-forecast plan pro of projects, Mark, you said you guys are going to have something I think that needs to be shared with probably the entire board. It will be. Okay, so we can actually see what the projects are, where they are, what, we, what we're looking like, what kind of time frame, what shifted dollars, and all that kind of good stuff. Sure. Okay, is that that's cool? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about a couple of payments, the large payments that were kind of, you know, starting to, to, to come online. Uh, there's one in October, I think you mentioned, then there's one in April 2020. Mm -hmm. What, what are those what are those dollars amount? I, I, I think just for the general public. So the, the one in October, um, I believe, is just under a million and you know, sorry, this one. Um, the one in October is nine hundred and fifty nine thousand six twenty five and then the one April first is eighteen thousand eighteen million mm -hmm. right nine hundred and fifty nine thousand. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And just for the general public so they can understand kinda of what that means. That we're all speaking about and know what that what that looks like certainly and, and kind of mm -hmm. how that will affect your re-forecast of the, the projects that that you've got online that will be coming online that are in the coffer and all that kind of stuff correct okay okay all right good 
All right, now, last but not least, sidewalk problems. And another thing has been going on for a minute. Yes, let's, let's just, I mean, by the time, we might not even need the project. <laughs> so, can you give me just one recap of kind of where we are, what kind of time frame, and will these guys be walking this year, or are we going to be out of school next year doing any idea what that sidewalk project? I just, you know, I know this. Miguel, if you can help us out. Sure. Yeah. Walk us through it. Right? Yes, yes, please walk us through this. Uh, yes. Uh, all three of the projects are very close to uh, the point where we advertise after we get the right of way that we need. And there's a couple of partial. You don't have all the right of way then. We do not. No. Got it. Okay. That uh, because we we have to wait until the design is pretty far along to begin the right of way acquisition. So we're at that point now where we're having title searches done and appraisals done on the parcel. Uh, luckily, a lot of the parcels were belong to the school, yeah. and so we've worked through the process there. We've engaged discussion for the uh, Board of Education, and it looks like that's <coughs> going to be one of the first acquisitions. Mm -hmm. on. But there's a couple of parcels on each of those projects, with the exception of the high school. The issue there is it's on a state route, so it has to be reviewed. Uh, we're proposing to install a, a flashing beacon at a crosswalk mm -hmm. to get the, the students from one side of the street, obviously, to, to the school side. Uh, that has to be approved by GDOC. So mm -hmm. that's, that application has been submitted. We're anticipating that they will approve that, and then on that one, we'll be ready to move to construct it, to advertise for mm -hmm. construction as soon as we get that. Mm -hmm. We anticipate it's probably going to be another couple of months before we finish the acquisition on the other two. So before the end of the year, we would we would be at a juncture where all three of those projects could be advertised for construction. They could be advertised all at once, or as soon as we finish the high school, we can advertise that one, and the other two will follow shortly thereafter. The expectation is that, that construction is probably going to be in the six to nine month time frame. Uh, and so by the end of next summer, we would anticipate all of those projects should be completed. Now, I've heard this song and dance of a while now, so I hope we're, <laughs> this is truly the dance, you know. And that's, that's where we are now. Okay. We're ready to advertise in, in the next couple of months. Okay, this is, you know, this has been a long process. So, yeah. All right, uh, and last but not least, um, you spoke about the, um, uh, the tennis courts. Uh, give me that, the, the, the tennis court project again so I can kind of make sure what we do that. I know so, we'll probably have a conversation again in Parks and Rec Committee, but I just want to kind of put it there on top of it. It'll be, it'll be advertised for construction. This week. This week. Okay. And, and we're looking at out, uh, what, what kind of possible time frame we're looking at to, to, to get on the courts, I guess. If, if we move forward okay. with the project, and um, so you looking again to go through the, the bidding process of 30 days, another month to, to review it, and then mm -hmm. if we award the low bid and move forward with it, uh, nine months for the <coughs> construction once they start, as the scope's designed right now. Okay, so we're looking at second end of second quarter, early third quarter next year. Next year. Before we are actually, uh, you have to play some tennis. Yes. Okay. All right. Just want to get my, my shoes and stuff ready, so that's all. Okay. Okay. Very <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I yield now. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. So I know we talked about the Chapel Hill runaways, but our first focus was the sidewalks for that project headed right. down towards uh, Chapel Hill High School. 
So can you give me an update on that? Because what I don't want one constituent asked me is that, and that's getting right away, is will the sidewalk project be held up till we get all of them? So can you give me a little light on that? Okay. Um, this, well, before we're ready to advertise for construction mm -hmm. on the For the project, sidewalk. For the sidewalk. It's the, it's two projects combined. There is a turn lane uh, widening mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. and the sidewalk project mm -hmm. along the same stretch of road. Mm -hmm. Both of those are combined. Mm -hmm. That project, we would have potentially <coughs> uh, 40-some parcels that would be impacted. Just for that? Portion. Just for that. Okay. Now, the question I think what you're alluding to is, if we were to acquire the right of way for the future widening, the, the extra lane, would it impact that project? It's going to take about the same amount of time because the process uh, that we have to go through is to identify the, the amount of area that is, that is impacted and what the value of that is. So it, it doesn't really impact uh, the schedule as much but it does impact the funding uh, that, that you may need. Um, not necessarily order of magnitude, but there will be an incremental value to the additional right-of-way. We're not at the juncture where we have identified with what area would, we would need for this project versus the future project, mm -hmm. uh, but when we get to that junction, I'll have a discussion with the board. And actually, it was just the opposite. So the intersections were part of the project, I mean, part of the supplies. And but if you're going to redo the intersection, that is the time to put in the sidewalk. So the sidewalks were part of the project. When the sidewalks first did the intersection. It was the intersections and the sidewalks. And that's the time for the sidewalks because it's cheaper. Yeah. Instead of coming so we, need, we just need to let the public know so that because they're sure. anticipating sidewalks. So they keep asking me because that's what they heard at the lab, at the town hall. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of wanted to make it clear what what's going on. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just again for the clarity. So again, I'm coming into I'm thinking I've got a two o'clock finance committee to talk about this reforecasting. And this is important. I know again what we're what going into our fourth year? Three and a half years Going in? Two years. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. Uh, three and a half years in. I, I just, just for the interior, this is before you, but um, at the very beginning, uh, we were considering doing this loss, and we're so thankful for uh, obviously the public voting for it. Um, but in the, in the wisdom of the Board of Commissioners, we recognize to do, unlike the jail, which was a single building, right? And from a program management, you can watch it, right? It's right here. It's not a lot of moving parts, mm -hmm. and that is one single building. Doing this process all over the county is a different animal. It's spread all over multiple projects going at the same time, right? Different type of critical path management, different type of funding management, right? Single building, all over the county. Two different approaches. So we recognize that uh, from an oversight, how important uh, program management was going to be. Um, and unlike the jail, we paid two points on oversight for that, two million dollars. On this one, we're like, okay, this is important. Again, staff is good at doing what they're responsible for. Yeah, transportation does this, parks does this. But being able to manage this across the whole county, we recognize, oh, we probably won't have to pay a premium on this, which is four points, four million dollars. And I remember we went through the process. Uh, you guys remember, it's all filmed on TV and stuff. We looked at the two people that bid it for this. There was Atkins, and there was the Moreland Russell team. And one of the questions that was fundamental was like, okay, if something ever gets off, you come clean and, and be honest about it and let us know what's going on. And I remember I asked that question a couple times, and I remember Mr. Morley himself stood up on that side. Chris Robinson, you've asked that question twice. Now, I don't know. Again, I, it was something that maybe happened in the past, and I wasn't hit on something historical, but it was that important to us. And again, this reforecasting that we're asking for, I don't want it to go to be dropped. We're getting busy now, right? And so it's one of those where, and, my concern is I'm hearing different messages, right? Uh, one of the things that we have to do is not only just managing this floss, which is capital, but we also have general fund impacts, right? And, and some of our decisions are made based on the intelligence that's provided, right? It doesn't need to be 
we want to know, from a board commission, we want to know the truth so we can set expectations. Don't tell us what you think we want to hear. We really need to know, okay, so how's the schedule? How's the financing? And let us make that ultimate call on how this goes down. But I'm just, I'm only emphasizing, I'll, 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 this, this, this is important, this reforecast. And so I, I again, I'm, I, I'm, I cannot underemphasize or overemphasize how important this information is. So if we're gonna get this tomorrow, to Commissioner Mitchell's point, this wasn't so much as to keep it within the committee. Um, all the board commission need to know it, but the point is, we need to get that information as soon as possible. So hopefully, mm -hmm. we asked for it two, oh, like a month or so ago. We said it was told, well, we can do it better. I said, well, take a couple months. I know what I was doing. I, I gave time. So I think it's about time. So I hope to look forward to getting that information. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Gable. And I believe uh, we have Mr. Baker coming up to give us a quick update regarding our vendors. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Commissioners. I'm David Good, I'm the uh, Communications Director for this plus. And as you can see up here, we now are at about 98 total vendors. Um, 36 of those vendors are right here in Douglas County. 28 of those vendors are right outside of uh, Douglas County. And the, um, the rest of the vendors are what we'll call non-local, more than 30 miles um, outside of the county. Uh, right now, we do have 34 active projects and 33 that are a part of that completed list that you guys see on each time. I'll do it from my actual page so I can make sure I'm on the microphone. But well, as you can see here, um, this is where 66% of the vendors are actually considered local, so those numbers are usually fluctuate between the 66 and 67%. Of those, we actually encounter our revenue are about 48% of the spots goes to that 67%. So right now, that's usually about the amount that we've been doing for the last couple of months. Uh, we really are making the emphasis of reaching out to Douglas County vendors. I know sometimes we look at those who actually go to the Chamber of Commerce and they're there, also considered local, but we actually look at those who are actually right here in Douglas County. Uh, we make strong visits really to District 3 and 4 for a lot of the um, a lot of business owners are so we actually talk to people in those areas <coughs> letting them know we have this plus going on make sure that you guys come out and actually participate because these are your dollars being spent you might as well also be able to reap some of the benefits of it and then with the percentage of the minority is 58 uh, percent non-minority and 42 percent minority um, in the beginning, we really were close to maybe 9% uh, minority. That number has increased because we have been reaching out to the community, letting them know this is something that Douglas County is working towards. So I'm glad to see that this number is continuing to rise, and hopefully we'll be able to make sure that we let every citizen, no matter what, you know, no matter what type of category they fall in, that they actually have the opportunity to work with the SPLOS and benefit from the SPLOS. And with that, that's it for my okay. Are there any questions? Okay, any questions for Mr. Good? Um, Commissioner Parker. Mr. Good, when you say minority, what group constitutes minority? Um, it, that's everything from those that's considered uh, DBE, um, MBE, um, and women business owned. Um, some of them are also are veteran disabled if they actually have put down their veteran disabled. A lot of times you can actually go to the their website and they'll put down who their owner is. And a lot of times they'll have pictures, so there's certain things you can tell just by looking at a picture, but other is based on their classification. So we don't just look at who what they're certified as. We also just look at, you know, who they are if they put down anything. So that's the way they're ready to tell. So you capture this by going to the website or going to the place of business. Right. Website, place of business, and also we'll go online to um, the DOTs, especially if they're in transportation, because DOT does require um, some of that part of it. And then, such as with uh, one of the car dealerships in Union um, City, um, I was able to actually go to their website and I saw who the owner was, and I was able to tell that they were a minor, minority business. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one, one quick question. Does yes, it include women? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. And in fact, I, I, in fact, I'm, I believe the largest one is a woman on um, SEI, Southeast Engineering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, this is, we don't have to get on it um, now, but perhaps somebody can come explain to me how we identify, unless they report, how do we identify? And I'm talking out loud. Uh, <coughs> think about the census. It's a very thin line where <coughs> it, it's a very thin line where we're trying to track. And unless they report, if we're going out there and we're going to, I'm going to say you're this, but I haven't told you I'm that. I want to be careful what I'm hearing, right? There has to be a formal process where this information is provided, which is validated. What we can't do is draw conclusions about what we're looking at. I, just something that I'm like, okay, well, how are we handling the census? So how, whatever the formal process is, <coughs> as long as we're compliant with that, I'm fine, but I want to make sure. And if we do it a different way, let's make sure we separate the two. Um, so I understand when y'all say y'all are reporting and how we're gathering information, if somebody chooses not to report, because they choose not to report, we can't impose, how, how do you avoid imposing, if, if I chose not to report what I, what I am? I, I don't report, I'm disabled. And you're saying, well, he's disabled. I don't want that reported. How do you, how do you deal with that? There's nothing to solve now, and this is more for, I guess we're taking internally. It's more of a, now, how y'all gonna do that now? And so, what we're looking at is really based on what's formally certified <coughs> reporting versus maybe internal. How are we? I want to know how we doing that material. How does the census do it? So, can we take that offline? Okay. Make sure our reports are accurate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we need something measurable and sustainable. Something that's yeah, just okay. I, it was more yeah. just what I heard. I, I'm not going anywhere with. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. For All right. Thank you. Okay. We will uh, take care. And, and you heard the gist of what the Commissioner Robinson just mentioned, right? We have an idea. We need something, we need something really more formal in right. terms of how we're identifying those EDs and MDs. Okay. Yeah. And, and one of the things that we definitely do do is that with, with the disabled, that was just one of if someone reports they're disabled. Yeah. Um, the only ones that we actually have problems with are those that don't report up to DOT because they're the best way to track. So if a company like a car dealership puts down just information, they don't report on anything unless I research it. Right. So it, it, I can always you know, provide that information to you guys. Okay, thank you so much. Really? Yeah. All right, well, commissioners, we'll move on to our next item. We, um, this tab, uh, tab number five on the public hearing is to consider amending the Douglas County Code of Ordinance, Chapter 14, Article 5, Traffic Regulations, Section 14-72C, Zones Prohibiting Trucks with More Than Six Wheels. The county will consider adding the following roads to this uh, to the uh, list of roads where trucks are over six wheels are prohibited. Those roads are Tyree Road, Liberty Road, portions of East Carroll Road, and Gruber's Lake Road. And Director Valentin, <coughs> can you just give us a quick? Yes, uh, good morning uh, again, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, we have had a number of uh, uh, reports and complaints regarding trucks uh, utilizing those routes. And uh, we have gone out and uh, looked, at, looked at the uh, road condition, looked at the routes, and confirmed that uh, uh, having trucks uh, in any kind of volume uh, utilize those routes is not in the best interest. And so we are, uh, in order for us to be able to uh, add these roads, at the prohibition uh, along these roads, uh, we have to have a public hearing, and that is what uh, we would be doing tomorrow. Uh, when we get a request or uh, we get a complaint regarding any particular route, we do some um, field investigation to, to confirm, and these are the roads that we have uh, uh, gone out and studied. Now, with Liberty Road, the complaint was essentially uh, anywhere along Liberty Road. Well, Liberty Road does go into the city of Villa Rica, and obviously we would not be able to control or uh, put that segment on our list, but uh, it would go from Post Road all the way up to, uh, to the city limits. Uh, along that route, just the way it lays out, there is a section of East Carroll Road uh, that is a joint 
East Carroll Road and uh, Liberty Road uh, segment, and so that is that's the reason East Carroll is included as well. Okay. Any questions for the commissioner? Yes. Um, and this doesn't this doesn't involve these roads that you listed today, but I mean a general question. I've talked with the. Uh, Bobby Holmes about uh, the traffic on Bright Star Road as a result of the huge warehouse complex right there on Bright Star. And the portion I'm concerned with is from the connector up to <coughs> Douglas Boulevard, which is all residential at, at present. And there's a school, there's a road that leads to a school right there. Uh, is there any way that we can direct those trucks? Because <clears throat> it's not the, that part of Bright Star Road is not designated no trucks from Dark, Douglas Boulevard up to Highway Five <clears throat> from that point is. Although we still see the dump trucks going up and down there, but um, is there any way that we can direct, say, a uh, truck route, a sign? trying to get them to go down the connector rather than going up to Douglas Boulevard because that's all residential from that point. The, um, there is uh, perhaps something we can do in terms of an outreach to the businesses that are there, uh, the manufacturing concerns. Uh, we, even if we were to add these, those roads or that road to the list, uh, this does not apply when there is a business that they have to access along that route. So it, it would not preclude them uh, from using that, that route. But they also have a state highway and, and they also have the connector in which to access that business. Correct. So if we could just direct the trucks, maybe with a sign that just says truck route <laughs> and point it down the connector, so that they will turn there rather than going on up to Douglas Boulevard. Um, that would help some, but I, I don't know if we can even do that. But we have a big problem with uh, Bright Star Road. We can, we can look into um, what is feasible for that area, and uh, then I'll report back to you. All right, thank you. Maybe you're back. Okay, thank you so much. Commissioner Mitchell? Just a couple of questions. So this is just more of a signage, or this is nothing more than just uh, allowing um, public safety to enforce, or I mean, help me out. So what, what are we doing here outside of what signage and yeah. being able to add this to GDOT uh, um, article, uh, chapter 14, article five, whatever that is. What, what this uh, article, uh, section 14-72, Okay. Um, what what it would do is it would <coughs> prohibit trucks that are not conducting business along that road Understood. from using that road to cut through um, on their way somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it allows the, the sheriff's department to enforce okay. that. Okay. So that's what this. Okay. So so will there be signage posted? Yes. So these guys will know because I think sometimes their GPS just kind of takes them around and sometimes they get off the track. But I mean, there's no excuse uh, for the law. But um, so there will be signage. Now, with that being said, there's a couple other places. Does this article fit? I mean, or also enforced in other places like is it Beachwood? Mark, can you help me out with this? Cherokee Boulevard, which has no more <coughs> cut through and all. Is that is this same enforcement or ordinance is being imp imposed on these guys as well, so they can understand that side of it, or is it? I mean, I know Cherokee Prince is partially in the city, partially in the county, so that's a kind of a little tricky situation, which we dealt with traffic, uh, truck trafficking, cutting through to get the 78. Uh, it's in either Beachwood, I think it is. Is that the right street? Well, refresh my memory, but okay. didn't, didn't we already pass this for those? I, I believe we did for yeah for Cherokee. I, I believe we did. I think we had a Beachwood too, but we have to check to make sure. We would have to check. Yeah. But already okay. And yeah. uh, so so. If but to your point, that is that is the ordinance that would apply. Okay. Regardless. Yeah. Of so so can we verify to make yeah. sure that they're on the list? Yeah. Second of all, and if the signage is a thing, because I know there's there is one coming off Fairburn to Cherokee to kind of hopefully get them to offset, not making that right turn on. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to uh, cherish you. Yeah, and because once you make that turn, you kind of like stuck. Turn away. Right, right, right. You kind of stuck at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so can we make sure those those two for sure to include definitely Beachwood because I think that's been a you know a running situation that the sheriff and I have been actually trying to address. You know, because at one time I think it was said even at Cherokee that that the sheriff can't write tickets from enforcement on that particular road. And I said, and I talked to the sheriff, and he said, that's absolutely incorrect. Um, so we've had some community conversations about that that particular road, and to include Beachwood uh, about these kind of situations and how can we address it. You know, I, I just hate when the, the truckers get caught up on that road by making a turn onto it, and they can't back up. But um, I just want to make sure that this will apply to those two roads for sure. Uh, so while we're doing this, let's just make sure it definitely applies and that the sheriff has definitely stated to me that there's, that's totally incorrect that they, they can write tickets on those roads. But I just want to verify that just to make sure so we kind of have this next meeting and make sure that we're covered. Okay. Um, outside of that, I'll yield back. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. We move on to tab number six to consider amending the Douglas County Code of Ordinance, Chapter 14, Article 3, Utility Easement, Section 14-40 through 14-45 and 14-54, and adding new Article um, 9, Sections 14-101 through 14-105, uh, pertaining to regulating small wireless facilities and antennas in the public right of way. Andrew Roberts, how are you doing this morning? Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, so in September of last year, the FCC decided they needed to make a change to the ordinances uh, surrounding 5G. The reason for that is that the United States is currently third in the race for getting 5G technology out behind China and South Korea. And so by December, 22 states had already passed uh, changes to reflect what was being mandated. And then it came down to the Georgia legislature last year who made it a goal to promote 5G wireless internet service through the uniform statewide fees and policies compensate local governments for their oversight and companies' use of public rights-of-way, review the fees to use public rights-of-way and ensure they're based on actual costs incurred by governments, encourage poll owners to negotiate with telecommunications and cable companies to allow the placement of 5G technology, and require county and city governments to charge lower fees than the Georgia Department of Transportation for their use of local rights-of-way. So, this was actually codified in 36-66C at the state, and it actually dictates in the legislation, which all becomes effective on October 1st, 2019, the, the actual rates and fees that are being, that we're told from the state that we can have. So by doing so, we're going to take this ordinance and roll these fees into there so that we can assess these fees. Also, we're going to get in line with what we're being mandated so we can have the tele telecommunications providers have access to the right of way. Um, the fees that are being assessed is $100 per small wireless facility. Um, each application for a replacement pole is $250. Fee for application for new poles is $1,000. So we're, all this stuff has been codified. And I mean, all this that, that's what we're trying to do here today. We need to put this in our ordinance, our, Article 14, sec, uh, uh, Section 3, so that we can actually have this on our books, so that we can actually charge for these fees. So we can actually have a presence in the right of way. When we went through the Transportation Subcommittee, we talked about this the other day. 5G technology is different than cell technology. The towers that you see before, this is a technology that's going to get closer to the ground. The reason being 5G eventually run 10 times faster than 4G. It's going to run autonomous vehicles. It's 
going to be out there in these corridors. The ordinance also prescribes what they can do as it relates to pole height, decorative poles, all that stuff is laid out, and that's what's in the packet in front of you of, the, of those changes to compensate for, for those uh, for the new codes that are being being out there. All this, all the counties are having to deal with this, mm -hmm. and like I said, everything goes in place October first. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to need to have a public hearing. We wanted to also we were asked the transportation subcommittee to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. So let me see. So, the example Phil pulled for us um, on a pole kind of gives you an idea. The timeline. Sorry. There's some more. So, there's distances that these units have to be from each other. Each of the providers are going to have their own frequencies, they're going to have their own desires, they're going to have their own idea of corridors. We don't know where those corridors are. Part of the regulations require that they meet with us out of good faith, which they, we've had two providers that have come and met with us. Um, but we really don't know the, the details yet of where, they, where these corridors might be. Assume that they'll probably act to place them in the most populated areas. That makes the most sense financially for them. But we don't know. Is there any questions about the code itself? Okay. Thank you. Um, question, Thank you, Madam And again, this is a this is a request for a public hearing, right? Yes it is. All right. So and, and again, we did talk about this in our transportation committee, but this is one of those where okay, we need to take it to the full board. Y'all need y'all need to hear what's being said. Um, obviously, this is coming from the federal level down. Telecommunications, um, uh, the power of their lobby is probably only um, second to obviously the railroad. Right? It, it has a sovereignty. It, it, it is what it is, right? And so, okay, we're, we're responding as you heard them say. It's the states, which means by default, it's going to get mandated to us at the moment. No problem. Um, but when you look at this, and I'm looking at, it and I'm like, okay, I get it. 5G brand new technology. Uh, what was originally proposed is that this was supposed to be a solution to the rural areas that wasn't stated. It was stated in the com um, committee meeting, but it was rural. But now that the legislation has passed, what some of the providers have said is that well, we're going to target initially the, the most populated areas. Uh, okay, so you got to pay attention to the off-talk sometimes. It's like, okay, wait a minute. What now? All right, so one of them, you know, they were targeting um, most densely populated area is right there along Skyview, um, Commissioner Mitchell, our area. So, you know, dense population, it's federal where the need really is. It's like interesting that they picked that as a target. Now, again, over record, you might want to go get what was presented to us, y'all can do that. But, but my point is this look at the distance between each one of these poles and this thing, and it's like, oh my God. Think about the current poles, and now you're talking about in between these poles, and it's like brand new networks, and they may not be on their poles. It's like, this is going to be like the Jetsons. How busy is our landscape going to be with these little 5G poles? And I get the benefit of it, but it, it has the potential to reshape our landscape. Like, what, what is the aesthetics going to be once, the, I mean, again, it's small right now. It's going to take time. I mean, you know, it's going to take a long time for this to sort of get all out like, like telephone poles and, and, and all the things that are in place, <coughs> but it's just something that makes you, you, you got to have sort of a futuristic view of, you know, you, know, you have strategists and you have futurists. You got to sort of forecast it like, oh my God, what are y'all really saying? It's all in the name of making money, but I get it. I know we want the technology, but you know, do you know what the impact is going to be on our lives for this benefit? That's all I want to say. Do you understand the impact on our, our physical landscape for the benefit of this higher technology? Right? And so, and the thing is, is my understanding, confirm for me, and again, you can bring these up in your comments with your public when they come hear this, which is, do you understand you're going to have both these networks, the, the current network is out there, and then you're going to add this one, and they both are going to be going at the same time, and you're not going to, I didn't hear in our committee, that you're going to replace the old network. They both are going to be. That's going to get sort of busy. 
Now, my other question, and this is confirmation is not being said, is that this is not underground, right? This is wires on top that's connecting all these two that ultimately goes back to a tower or something? Some yeah, kind of power it's, source? it's they'll, they'll have to be connected in the right of way um, through a power source from pole to pole. Both. So it is both. Mm -hmm. uh, pay attention. Right. I, I just want to highlight that. I mean, everything else is good. The code in which um, Manager Roberts has laid out. I'm comfortable with, that's why I said bring it forth. I just want to bring out these highlights that y'all can talk to y'all public and as they weigh in. It's not that we can do much about it, <laughs> but yet you need to weigh in on can can we shape it? So the question became, and I'll leave it with this for you guys to weigh in, because it's a public hearing um, authorization, which is what about um, in our areas of beautification? And Miguel, you can speak to this, or one of y'all can speak to what happens um, in historical areas where the poles, I mean, I'm talking about architectural review controls, that type of stuff. What about that? I mean, do we have any say in the types of poles or the types of structures uh, that are yes. put here? Please. Yes, Commissioner. And actually, actually, that's a part of the code. If they replace, if they, if it, if it's a decorative pole in a historical district or something of that nature, then they have to, if we don't want them to attach to our pole, then they have to replace it with something that looks just like that for their use. And that's the same thing for um, the other poles that would be in the right of way. Like if they're wooden poles, you know, we don't want them on the poles and they're gonna put their own pole, they have to, it has to match. Uh, and also there's other standards when you get into like a downtown area like the city of Douglasville that would be very prescriptive on where they can actually locate. Now, I do wanna add that this ordinance update is actually, this is a Board of Commissioner vote, and it, it, it involves the right of way. What we don't have, and what we'll have to do in November, is actually draft a uh, unified development code that deals with this that is on private property. And that would have to go through the Board of, um, the Planning and Zoning Board and the Board of Commissioners vote. But, Today, this is the code that needs to be in place for us to have it by October 1st to address this. Okay. Ron, I realize this is a federal mandate. <coughs> you know, we talked about that we discussed this in our transportation committee meeting, but certainly wanted to make sure we reiterate with those providers that we are looking for uniformity so it really would impact. So hopefully, it will not impact our unification plan to keep things um, in order around here. So um, you show us several types, but you know with various, uh, if you have three providers, do they have all different types of equipment or they be uniform and just maybe have a label that says at and or whoever? Ma'am, sure, I'm not really sure what their specific equipment looks like. Phil was kind enough to pull some of these examples off the internet and that's all we had really. Um, but I don't know what the, what the specific providers would look like. Um, just wanted to see if it there could be some exclusivity for us and just make sure that if, if they order one particular brand, it could just make sure all of them look alike for Douglas County, perhaps. That's a very good thought. From a different very, very good thought. company or, or provider. For uniformity. On. Yeah. Sure. That's key. All right, thank you. And Commissioner sure. Guider has something for you, Ronnie. Okay. Okay, so you're saying that although we have poles out there, they they can put new poles in, shorter poles. Um, well, I mean, that's the... And then run the wire, <coughs> the, the fiber, or right. whatever, copper, uh, from pole to pole. So, and they're not a uh, long distance away from each other. No, ma'am. I mean, the two providers that came in, uh, one of them met with James and I and, and Phil, and then another one came in and met um, with Phil, and um, I think Miguel was there that day. But they... They didn't really have anything specific on, um, well, they have they have requirements of distances. I think it was like 400 feet. What's the, that's, um, that's not feet. that far. That's it's, a block. It's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's not that far. And, um, and, and so when they, at, at right now what we're doing is we're preparing for them, <clears throat> if they come back in and we are able to get this on the books and we have some, uh, some ways to kind of control a little bit of, of how how that corridor looks like. 
Well, can the poles be used for other purposes, like a light being put on top of the pole? A dual use? I mean, the, 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 the legislation is really meant to encourage collaboration between the providers, but they don't seem interested in doing that. So, I mean, there's basically well, what about us and, you know, the county and them? Uh, can we say, well, can we put a, a light on this pole because we need to lighten up that area? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking. I don't. I don't know. That'd be a good Miguel question. I know that there's part of that. We had some discussion. And another staff part that about. I'm concerned with is the wires underneath there, because Miguel, you will recall at it the post grade <coughs> ridge. The reason we couldn't put a guardrail up was because of all the wires up under there. Hmm. Uh, so we've got to be careful that we protect. Um, you know, safety measures that we would have to do uh, going down the road, but uh, maybe have it as close to the pavement as possible. So that well, um, some of the some of the requirements um, that the technology uh, is going to necessitate, they're going to have to be at a certain minimum height, so they can't be too close to the ground. Um, it, it's almost. Uh, the, the, the old system, the 4G system, had very high towers and they were able to broadcast the signal a long distance. These are much lower to the ground. Uh, they're supposed to have uh, overlapping coverage uh, because one of the benefits of, of the 5G is the ability to interact, communicate with autonomous vehicles. So the signals that are required for, for that navigation is this is what's supposed to do it. So it has to be close to the ground. It generally wants to be along corridors uh, because that's where the greatest need is going to be. Uh, but it's interesting to your question, uh, can we have, and, and to Madam Chair's question about, can we have some s sort of uniformity? The legislation itself, when it got to that issue, uh, they punted on it, they essentially said it, uh, rather than define, it says it, it can't be any high, any more than so many cubic feet of, of volume. So they they didn't even uh, go to the issue of they should be um, you know cylindrical, similar to the others. None of that. When we met with the uh, providers, uh, the two, uh, at least I met with one of them. Uh, when we spoke to them in terms of can you cohabitate with the other provider, if they come in and they have a corridor, can you go on the same pole? The, the response was absolutely not. It will interfere with their signal. So, mm -hmm. from the legislative standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, they have they have freedom to design these things in whatever fashion. Obviously, they can't be too objectionable uh, because then we run into different issues. But so, I mean, they could be cylindrical. Most of the ones that I've seen are cylindrical. Uh, perhaps uh, 18 inches high and maybe a foot in diameter, something like that. But they could be cubes, and, and the, the uh, technology is going to evolve. There's nothing in the legislation that prescribes how they're going to be designed, how they're going to look. It even talks about having not only the, the cylinder or the cube, if you will, but having antennas that protrude from that. So. At this point, we do not have a lot of detail other than <coughs> what the legislation that's been passed and to the extent that we can implement any kind of control, or at least know what they're proposing on, on the right-of-way, um, this is the way to do it. Um, but, but they were successful at going from what used to be almost a universal prohibition against these things being in the right-of-way to almost having it by right that they can go in there subject to very minimal uh, regulation. Well, we just have to be real careful about those underground wires too, that they don't prohibit our maintenance of our roads. And I hope they're not going to tear up our roads when they're installing the wire. Like the cable people are doing and stuff like that. So. I hope so too, but yeah. I'm afraid that on occasion that they, they are going to be like any other utility because they're so they have to be bonded. They, they, they have to follow our criteria and they would be responsible for restoration 
Uh, there is no provision in the uh, statute uh, for them to be bonded as such. Well, I mean, they should bond to the county that they will repair those roads. Oh, yes. They damage the roads. Yes. Just like the pipeline, when they went through, they, they made a bond. They are required to do that. And in fact, <coughs> one thing that the legislation did provide for is if they do not comply with our criteria, that we do not have to issue <coughs> permits. So at least there's a bit of a stick as it relates to uh, they have to comply. And one last question. This is revenue to the county also by, with the permits. Well, it's, it's, rev it's intended to be revenue neutral. So the, leg yeah. Yeah, the legislation <laughs> essentially said, here's the maximum that you can uh, charge for an application fee or a maintenance fee, meaning for staying attached to the pole, uh, and it's renewed uh, annually. Mm -hmm. But it is subject to audit, and so we have to have the personnel handling the application reviews, uh, doing the field inspections, and we're going to have to balance the revenue that we collect against those expenditures. Mm -hmm. So there's no net <coughs> revenue to the county. Mm -hmm. All right, I yield back. Commissioner Carthen, I believe you, that you had Oh, that, that was, that was it. That, that was going to be my question. Um, because when I sat on the Board of Assessors, we did take a look at going around to assess each one of those um, cellular poles because there are a lot of poles out there that we're not <coughs> collecting revenue on. Mm -hmm. and, and just to see if they were actually self-reporting, and there were quite a few that we found were not. Uh, so I'd be very interested in, in seeing how many applications you get because you can have one pole that has about eight nods on it, different providers. So I'd just be interested in, in <coughs> taking a look at that. And you might want to get with the Board of Assessors, Ron, to, to see what they found when they did that. Maybe about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I yield. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Okay. Let's wrap this all up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm hearing you correctly, even though I know it's coming down via, via the state and everybody else and, and kind of what we have to do, we're just trying to orchestrate some type of makeup of what they do and how they do in Douglas County, do business in Douglas County. But if I heard you correctly, they could actually, each provider could come through and put a poll up. That's going to be interesting. That's going to be extremely interesting. And there's, at, at this point, I guess we publish it all as a board of commissioners kind of at least talk to our legislators, not that they could do much about it, but to allow that to be that wide open. You know, not to understand if they put, if one provider put up a poll, then everybody can get on that poll or they get on that tower or whatever that is, that we kind of, you know, help with the, uh, the infrastructure. Because that's what it sounds like, but, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. So that means if AT&T and whomever else come through, they just put up a poll every so many hundred feet and in addition to the poles that are already there that just doesn't that it just doesn't register to me like that that i legislate towards think about that to make sure that are we clear that he's telling me that you know they can come in and just start polling or putting a poll <laughs> you know polls throughout that, that they, they are in uh, commissioner to your point they are encouraged under the legislation to actually, as a first line of, uh, as a first approach, to locate on existing poles. That is, that's what the legislation encourages. Now, if that does not work with their infrastructure or their signal or what have you, then that's when they can install a new pole. Or if and we they, can't say no. We cannot say no unless, um, and I, in my discussions. <clears throat> with them, what I asked was, well, uh, the legislation says that that if, if you want to locate on this corner and there's a pole across the street and I want to, uh, rather than where you're wanting to go, I, I'd rather you, instead of installing a new pole on this corner, go catty corner on the other side to an existing pole, mm -hmm. uh, that that's what I'm going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. The legislation... Uh, allows for us to do that. We, we could say within a hundred feet of where they're proposing to locate, we can suggest that they'd rather locate there. Mm -hmm. Now the issue becomes, 
is that pole functional for their, for their uh, signal and all like that? If the pole does not have the capability structurally to support this canister or mm -hmm. whatever it might be, <clears throat> then they're allowed to replace that pole with a new pole that can support it at that location. So there's, there's a little leeway in us being able to have some suggestions as to where they locate, but there is provision for them to say, no, that does not work with our signal. And what I did ask him was, well, I would be looking for some documentation of coverage that, in fact, it doesn't work before I just say, you yeah. This is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. It is. This is going to be really interesting. Ken, have you had a chance to look at look this over at? I have, but this is driven mostly by that department and that law. But this is it's complicated yeah. and convoluted, mm -hmm. and it's an exercise of control by both the Fed and the state. Mm -hmm. I'm just letting y'all know. Yeah. Wow. <coughs> okay. Well, cause this, and, and I'm assuming these these mini towers pieces will be microwavable to kind of go travel from one to the other. I don't know if that's the 5G or is it something totally different that what they're after? You know, I, I mean, you, you hear about the 5G and what they're doing and what, you know, that's the new wave of technology. The, uh, the canisters will broadcast the signal, but the canister, I'm, I'm using canisters based on what was I shown understand. here, but they could have any configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be connected, so they will all gotcha. broadcast the signal gotcha. near simultaneously. Got it. Wow, okay, all right. This is this is this is not good. How are we gonna cut the roadways? <laughs> I, I, we, 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 we just kinda they just decide on what they want to do. And we just gotta uh, accommodate, I guess, from my understanding what I'm hearing. Or do we write something within our within our ordinance, uh, irregardless of what they're saying? I mean, the state is mandating, but do we write something in our ordinance that will protect us from 15 different poles because everybody want to be on that corner. And I'm being over, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, when that's cha when that's challenged one day, they're going to overwrite whatever you write, in my opinion. I don't know what y'all think, but I think when the FCC rules and the state, they're going to override it. I would agree. I, I think even the statute has some language in there that says that uh, local uh, municipalities or counties mm -hmm. cannot enact uh, charge different fees or any right. higher fees or anything like that or anything that interferes uh, with their ability to broadcast their signal. There's a provision in here also that deals with imminent risk to public safety so at some point the authority, if the authority, I guess the county determined that there was a public safety risk from something that the providers were doing then we do have the right to ask them to address that risk, whatever that is. Uh, that would be if, if they're trying to locate a pole at an intersection and interferes with the site, triangle, site distance of vehicle, then we can ask them to locate it somewhere else. Or if it interferes with our new whole system that we're putting up, uh, our radio system, if by chance that that stand a chance to say to fight against this to say no because you're going to cause our uh, an interception with our uh, uh, radio system. It, it should, uh, to, to, to my knowledge, it should not impact that because it's a very different frequency. Well, I, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what we anticipate. But Correct. until you start dealing with uh, waves, then you'll you'll know what you're dealing with. So. I yield back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Because I was expecting this particular topic to generate about quite a bit of a discussion regarding 5G, so that's why we were so excited to, after the Transportation Committee, the Vice Chairman, just really need to bring it to the board so we could just enlighten y'all about this federal and state mandate. We'll move on to the next item, y'all, which is tab number seven, authorization to approve an agreement with Cone for elevator, elevator maintenance at the Douglas County Law Enforcement Center in the annual amount of $9,859.92. An authorized <coughs> chairman to sign all related documents pending legal review. Uh, Major Holmes. This is the annual contract for Cone, who does the maintenance for our elevators there. It's pretty self-explanatory, so. 
submitted for consideration in budget year 2006. Um, we're a little bit behind on our schedule for um, new libraries in the county. Um, this was is an additional library to support the residents south of I-20 in the eastern part of Douglas County where there's still currently no services. Um, the Chapel Hill Anawanke Library would approximately um, be about 30,000 square feet. It would be a two-story library housing a diverse collection of books and materials. Additionally, the goal is to provide uh, community maker space and enhanced technology, as well as multiple meeting rooms and study spaces. The library would become the main hub of the county libraries and house the library offices. Um, this library is to, to include outdoor trails and multi-use educational space, maker space technology, including 3D printing and um, various unique features with um, sewing machines, music production, steam technologies. Um, with future additions to include children's play space, play spaces, splash pad, and a community amphitheater. Um, we're at this time, we're asking to begin the application process with the state. Our application is due September 30th. Um, this is just a very initial application, letting the state know that we are interested in seeking funding. Um, funding would begin, we would get on, this is Lee Dollar. He knows more about all of this. He's with our regional library. Okay. I'm Lee Dollar with the West Georgia Regional Library System. And uh, the state uh, funds usually three to five uh, library construction projects a year. And right now, I think there's 15 to 17 on the list right now. So this initial phase would be just to get on the list uh, is there's a very simple application to fill out to to be <laughs> placed on the list. It's a non-binding kind of letting the state level know that you're interested in a new library. And uh, as it progresses up the list, uh, then things get a little bit more serious as uh, you get closer to getting funded. So really, the the bottom line is there's a very simple. I think it's like a six or seven page application. Uh, not very complicated, uh, which entitles you, when funded, to get $2 million of state money to go toward your project. That is the limit the state has is $2 million. And uh, you can withdraw at any time uh, up until you're funded. So you, it's, it's too late to withdraw if, you, if the legislature in their session and they leave in April and say this project is funded, that's kind of where the line is drawn, as long as you withdraw, probably the best thing to do is withdraw before the session begins in the year that you're probably going to get funded. Uh, you're looking at probably as it stands right now, and it's all based on how much influence you have under the Gold Dome. I've seen projects that were number 21 on the list when the list was longer get funded. So it's, it's, really, it's really politics and who knows who and where and uh, when you want to get funded. It, obviously, if this would be on a splost or something, you wouldn't want to get funded in the next year or two, but it's critical that you get on the list. That is the, the major deal. So, uh, you know, I know you all looking at a 33,000 square foot library. It'd be a substantially more than what the state would provide, but it would be some assistance uh, to me. And, and once the two million is turned over to to you guys, as long as it's spent on the library construction, y'all have full control of it. The state doesn't necessarily want to have a, a hand in the construction as far as any day to day or any of that kind of stuff. It would be just uh, kind of uh, subject to audit. That would be the only requirement that would they would have. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try to ask uh, answer. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Dyer. Yes, uh, Linda, do you know how many square feet the Dog River Library has? Dog River is just un under 15,000. And 
How much are we wanting to bail? We're asking for 30,000 square feet. Um, this is approximately about a $10 million facility. It would be a two-story mm -hmm. library. Okay. I know that we do own the um, rights, the, the plans uh, for the Dawn River Library, so that is an option to take that and expand the original plans oh, for Dawn River. Oh, we can reduce the size, can we not? <laughs> yes, we can reduce the size of it. Um, given We're not locked into that 30,000 square feet. No, we are not. Okay. Um, there's a formula <coughs> that the state has for um, how much library square footage you need per um, concerning population, and we're way way behind in where we should be at this point. Um, our 2025 estimate is about 150,000 square feet of library, um, and we're currently just under 50,000 square feet of library usage for the county. So we're a bit behind in what the state gears as library. Um, that was really our favor, really. I'm sorry? It would help us probably <coughs> get the fact that we are so behind. But um, you're saying that we can actually use the same plans. That's my understanding from when it's very unusual. <laughs> and architecture has a uh, say so about that. Mm -hmm. But um, but we could build one. Uh, and do you know how much it costs to build that one? Dog River was 4.2 million. So we matched two, 2 million? We did get the 2 million match from the state, so the county was out around 2.6 million, I believe. Okay. Average construction cost for public libraries right now in Georgia is running about $225 a square foot. That includes furnishings and doesn't include material, and doesn't include books or anything, but for uh, furnishing, furnishings and the actual physical construction of the building, is running about two hundred twenty-five dollars a square foot. When these, when these plans were originated in two thousand six, it was around two hundred per square foot. Okay, but um, we could always build a smaller one and add to it. Uh, we we could. Um, that is an option. Um, we were definitely in need of more space um, if we decided not to go through with a new construction project. Then our next big focus is the full renovation of this Selman library, but there's currently no library services in Chapel Hill and Awiki area. I know we're doing it. Thank you. All right, I can get back. Okay, thank you so much. Commissioner Yes. So can you give me a little bit more insight on um, moving up the list and that two million dollars you said could only be used on construction, yes, right? So, so it can't be used for land purchase, uh, preliminary drawing. Well, architectural plans, yes. Preliminary drawings, no. <laughs> and just because you all have experience with this, and I don't, so I'm, I'm leaning on you. How long would it take to? draw down those funds from the state once you're approved and then from at that point to conception of the library uh, once once you're allocated money on the first million of state money it's 90 percent state 10 percent local and on the second million it's 50 percent state 50 percent local so uh, obviously as you start drawing down money in your early processes, the state picks up the tap for most of the first million, and then the second million is an equal match, and then beyond that, it's completely local. And to <coughs> your point, Lindsay, it would be best to have one in the Chapel Hill and Awaki area as opposed to renovating the film. Yes, the, um, something in the Chapel Hill area, and the Chapel Hill area will definitely um, relieve some of the pressure from here on Selman and our others as well. Um, Selman is completely overwhelmed because we have nothing in that part of the county. So that would even out um, some of our, our stress, some of the um, demands that are on the Selman Library, and um, just bringing more business, more community to the Chapel Hill area. 
would be wonderful. We are still pulling, um, the libraries are on a statewide system, so we're pulling not just Douglas County residents, but residents from all over the state. That would also help pull more from Common Fulton as well. Okay. When you all did the Dog River <coughs> Library, you equated how many houses would benefit from that? Is that how you? I was not involved with the uh, with that initial, but I'm sure. Um, you know, population had a lot to do with uh, population density. Had a lot to do with how they. Because I know Chapel Hill area is probably more highly populated yes. than than the Dog River, would, which would hence why we do need why a bigger facility, a larger, space. A, larger a larger space. Yeah, I'm just trying to make it make sense. Great. Right. Okay. With that idea, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice yeah. yeah, okay. So, again, library. Um, Selman Drive, I get it. Um, you know, sort of, I like it to like Deer Lake. You, we're behind. Right? Just like we're parks and rec, we're four indoor facilities behind, right? We, we recognize that. We, we, we understand that. That goes to libraries as well. We're behind. Um, we talk about a lot about. Um, certain areas not being served, right? So here we are, library, I get it. So um, <coughs> what I heard you say, based on you articulate, like this is, sounds like a, a multi-purpose facility, right? Um, I heard two stories, I, I heard, um, it's very thoughtful, it goes beyond just a traditional library with books on the shelf, it, it, it has, uh, it's, it's meeting a, a higher community need. Is that yes. true? Is that Absolutely. Okay. And we're interested in involving local businesses. Right. Um, one of the projects with the Villa Rica Library, when they um, built their new one a few years ago, they also received um, local money from local businesses and um, donors. And that's right. something we would certainly like to see um, right. with some of the newer manufacturing facilities and businesses coming into the county. We would certainly like to see more incorporation of libraries in that, I mean, and businesses into the library um, with our major spaces, the technology in the area. Um, we're interested in reaching out and meeting needs of businesses as well as the library um, patrons. Right. Um, our business, our community room spaces are constantly booked with local businesses and companies that are always looking for a meeting space that they, they don't currently have. So that that's one of the um, big demands that we have right now is for meeting space that um, we simply don't have any room to provide that at this time. Absolutely. We have no executive suites. We have no class A property. We have nothing we got for the west of Atlanta, right? So I mean, I'm hearing a much bigger um, need that can be met beyond that is probably tangential. Um, no, this is good. I mean, I get, get on the list. It's a process. <laughs> I understand how it works. But I'm, I, I am encouraged. Um, you know, we, we talk about libraries and, and do people, there's something still about a book. Right? It, there's something still about, um, it's, it's just, uh, it's not just about the book alone in today's library system, but still, there's something about knowledge, about education, and having people come together to solve problems, to, to inquire, to expand the mind. I mean, you go on, I mean, I'm probably singing you know, to the choir, but I'm encouraged by this need that it, it can't, we can't believe that libraries are going to go the way of dinosaurs if we don't have them. They're like, no, we'll, we'll be remiss in believing that the library is not core. No difference within a school. You've got to have a library. No more within the community. You've got to have a library. The minute you start saying that education is no longer important, you want to sort of swipe that to the side. Now you're getting it to, yeah, okay, I, I can never support getting rid of libraries or the need to, to read and education. Um, and when you don't serve the population of people who really need it, um, your, your, your area, your culture, your society, you will know, be subject to go down. So, well done. I look forward to this coming forward. So, Great. are you ready? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. There didn't more. I can move on. Okay. We'll move on to tab number nine, authorization to fund the 2019 GEP Corps Pension Fund at the required slash recommended level of $6.8 million and amended <coughs> budget by one million two hundred fifty nine thousand nine hundred forty six dollars director Holman uh, yes ma'am um, this was uh, discussed at our mid-year retreat um, so I'm just bringing this before y'all for an official vote um, we're asking for an official vote um, as you know that our uh, get core retirement uh, contribution we had budgeted around 5.6 um, and when the actuarial uh, study was done 
was done at the end of May. We received the results in the first of June. Uh, came out to be $6.8 million that needs to be contributed um, to the uh, GEPCOR fund. Um, this will, um, of course, be a budget amendment. Um, and when I looked at sources of revenue instead of taking from fund balance, uh, we are seeing a trend in our local option sales tax of approximately $100,000 a month, uh, coming in more than what we projected. Therefore, I'm suggesting or re making a recommendation that when we amend the budget, we increase local option sales tax for the amount that we need for the retirement. I also have invited Paul Bates from the Accor here if y'all have any specific questions about the plan that's a little bit above my knowledge of the plan if y'all have any questions to that. Okay. Any questions from the board, Vice Chairman Robinson? Sure. I'm not on the, on sort of the pension committee or anything like that, so my, my questions are just generic in nature. All right. So, um, um, again, from a, from a budgeting perspective, you know, we're going back to being consistent, um, you have uh, recurring and non-recurring events. And so when you're planning, there are certain things that they just they happen, and we have to properly be able to respond to that part of the budgeting process to make sure you have enough, enough elasticity inside your budget to accommodate steps and loads, right? This is like 101. So here we are in the budget process, a little bit more than what we, we anticipated, but again, it could be higher, it could be lower. Um, and it just this time it happens to be higher. My, my question then becomes, my, my question becomes, all right, you know, take it out of the local option sales tax versus the fund balance, but does it really matter? You know, how you frame it. Um, okay. Is there any any reason why this year is a little bit higher, or is it just normal, right? In other words, it's an ebb and flow. Um, not that I'm concerned, because again, we we've, we've had times where it was less, uh, and that's my first question. That's more uh, Paul can come answer that, but. When we talked about sources, one of the things we did in the amendment early this year, we um, uh, we amended our budget to a um, when we got the TANS in there. We left two million on the table for cash. We were using for CSB, we used it for DOT projects, and we also said other things that finance may need. Uh, does that have any factor in this, or we're just choosing not to use that as a source? We're just going to let that cash go back. Yeah, this we, is we talked about that publicly, so I need to sure. tie it off. The TANS is strictly cash flow. Okay. It's just strictly a balance sheet transaction. So right. it's strictly just cash coming into the account. Where this right here is actually a expenditure, uh, so an income statement per se, um, uh, transaction that we need to um, increase our expenditures for the retirement contribution from the original 5.6 to the 6.8. I said, we uh, made a statement publicly right, that we were going to use that cash in the event we, we had to, mm -hmm. right, to float ourselves to the end for the property tax that we coming in for us to pay it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Washington tells taxes come in such a way that, ooh, we're okay. We can relieve the pressure through the normal routes. So that get on going, the revenues came in more than we wanted to, so we didn't have to use this loan to pay our bills. Correct. Our revenue came in stronger. So I just. That is correct. Because we made a. a, we made a, a an amendment, we passed something, we, we passed something early this year when we used the TANS, we made an amendment to use cash a certain way. So I just want to make sure that the public understand that we're not going to use that option now and that goes away. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. And then any funds, of course, that we don't use, um, we'll just go back, we'll pay the loan, the TAN, um, off hopefully this year, just like we have the past two years yep. early, early, a month early. Um, but um, this will, uh, this right here is just the expenditure side of the uh, equation versus the cash. I just want to tie it two together. You know, mm -hmm. somebody sometimes yes. is paying attention and they'll say, but you guys said we're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Any questions? <coughs> I think we're good. All right. We'll move on to tab number 10, authorization to enter into a professional services contract with Artifact LLC to provide architectural and structural design services for the um, Douglas County Fire Department training and storage facility and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacox. Yes, ma'am. Um, back in March of this year, we uh, uh, received bids in for the construction of the new uh, storage building uh, at the D SCFD training complex. Those prices were more than we had available to spend 
So uh, we uh, took the opportunity to go back and look at the structure and find ways to save money. Uh, in doing that, uh, we need a professional uh, firm to come in and work with us on now on the, arch re the architectural redesign and engineering for this pr pr proposed building. Uh, Artifacts is the company that's been working with us uh, for several months as we've gone through this process. Uh, they've offered to, uh, again, provide the drawings uh, and the um, services uh, to the fire department for an amount totaling $10,500. The fire department is recommending that, uh, that this agreement be signed with Artifacts. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, I'll move on to the next item, tab number 11, approval of amending of the amending purchasing card and credit card policy, purchasing the card and or credit card user agreement, Douglas County Tribal Policy and uh, Procedures Manual and the Douglas County Board Appointment Policy, Legal Department. Yeah, Madam Chair, Chair yeah, Madam Chair, at, the, at your request and for board members, the Madam Chair asked us to review the purchasing card, credit card policy, the purchasing user agreement, or excuse me, credit card user agreement, the travel policies. I'm going to deal with those three first and separate those from board appointment policy. And essentially we went through and tried to make uniform those three. Uh, most of the verbiage, 95% of it's the same, but I want to point out what's probably a little bit upgrading. Uh, the county purchasing cards, credit cards shall not be used for the purchase of items of a personal use. County purchasing cards and credit cards shall not be used for cash refunds or advances. County purchasing cards and credit cards shall not be used for purchase of items specifically restricted by this policy unless a special exemption is granted by the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. County purchasing cards and credit cards shall not be used for the purchase of alcohol, alcohol related products, tobacco or tobacco related products. Electronic uh, cigarettes or electronic cigarette related product, products or other similar items. County purchasing cards and credit cards uh, shall not be used for the purchase of goods services that are in an approved budget uh, approved by the county. County purchasing credit cards shall not be used, or that's just terminology, for anything in violation of Georgia law. Um, now, what happened with the you got the you got the travel policy that mentions the board of commissioners, but more or less talks about employees. We've brought those two together, so it treats everybody that's getting reimbursed under Douglas County policy as one and the same for purpose of that whether you're uh, an elected official, whether you are uh, an employee, or whether you're a designated agent to <coughs> use a credit card. And I don't think there are that many. Uh, the other part it does is we're getting into the, a circumstance where state by state is saying some things are legal and some things aren't legal. We were at a conference in Colorado is buying a marijuana cigarette legal or not. We're trying to avoid all that by just simply saying you can't buy items for a personal use that aren't related to the travel reimbursement policy. You get, you know, your food paid for, obviously, if you're on an approved thing, you get your travel, your accommodations. But things outside of that that are purely personal in nature, you don't get it paid for, or if it's something that would violate Georgia law, among other things. I, the, I thought that the three policies related to that had to track changes. I've sent all of y'all an email so that y'all can actually look at the red line, what was changed, so you'll know. Okay, I apologize. We, uh, when Stephanie sent this over, she sent the clean version over, but I've now sent sent y'all so you have in your email box the actual red line of each everything that was changed so you know what was changed and you'll see most of it is still the same there's some clarification there's some this and that and yonder but essentially this is driven by the, cha uh, the chair asked me to or us legal to clean up those policies and make them more uniform and so we've done that with the chair's uh, blessing so that's what you have before you uh, and secondarily, and I might need Lisa a little bit more on this, the Douglas County Board appointment policy was more driven by, y'all asked the county clerk to put something down, what your policies are. And Lisa, I'll help you, but if I miss something, you please tell me because uh, I'm, I may miss something else. 
in my review of this, essentially what it does is it puts a time frame that you have to leave appointments open, I believe, at least 14 days. I think that you solicit from the public as a whole. Uh, if there is no uh, applicant for a particular job, doesn't mean that just because there's one applicant, you have to choose them, by the way. Just saying it's a way you create a pool of people to get jobs. If there is no applicant, then the board or a board member can suggest somebody. Uh, outside groups can suggest somebody, et cetera. But ultimately, it's still within y'all's discretion who gets appointed. So that policy, and Lisa, you want to talk more about that? Because Lisa worked hard on that one, I think. And yeah, just basically, um, we it's, it's stating that we're going to advertise for all open positions on boards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are still some that are district driven. You know, you pick who you would like to serve in your district, but we'll still follow the same process. We'll still advertise and you'll have a bigger pool to choose from. And you would still, you know, you'd still uh, have discussions in executive session, mainly not hurt anybody or embarrass anybody, but the vote still has to occur publicly. So we were at it, we're fine with it. It, it's more generated by what Lisa understands y'all's practice to be and to open up the idea that there's going to be a time frame for a window to be open in the advertising process and receipt, receipt of candidates. Okay. Madam Chair, we can address any of those with, with uh, Lisa's help. <laughs> There's a lot of policy to be pushed in one vote. Um, it, it, they're not necessarily related. I, um, but, but okay, I, I get the point. Um, on, on the board appointments, and this is, I'm taking the reverse. Should the question becomes: Should to get proper representation from the county? Um, I've always been of the position that. Um, Appointments should come out of the districts. Uh, I, I, some of the boards, you have CD County. You, it was a lot of old politics that has evolved forward. I just think that, 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 in my opinion, each board should be district-based. Now, there may be some legislation that we may have to overcome to make that comport, but I, I you know, it, it's just one of those where, and you just watch how the appointments go. It's like, oh, we want to make it because every, every district has a certain view, and, and it, it, it's just something that's, that's a little different than uh, congressional or the Senate. It, it, it's, it, it's important, right? But when you have a concentration of just inside appointments that, that is not at least has a district orientation, it, it just becomes, hmm, it gets highly concentrated. Um, and so I, I just, I, I, so I, I'm not saying that I would, it's something to talk about. So that one, when you talk about board appointments, it's not just about our uh, window of time in which you respond. The question is, who gets to get on the board and, and where are they pulled from? All right? I think that's important. So you, you leave your, and this is to my, my, my colleagues, you leave your voice on the table when you don't advocate for your district to at least have representation on each board. Right. It's okay if you don't want to think this is worthy of picking up. Intuitive layout. The New World ERP homepage makes it easy to My bad. I'm sorry. The information most I tricked something to wrong. All data on this page is unique. Just click at the bottom the for uh, volume and just <laughs> turn it off. To begin our brief tour of the home page. Sorry about that. No, that was, I guess I need to let up. Okay, my bad. That was, actually, that was good. Anyway, you get my point. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, but but I, I, I was... Um, about this. It's something to think about. When, I mean, again, the time I've been here, we've always had this internal conversation about board appointments, right? You, you hear com commentary about political appointees and this, that, and other. Nah, I get it. So here we are, guys. We're supposed to be creating legislation. Let's, should this be revisited at this time where we make a push for each. I mean, now the challenge we do have, now even in making that statement, I'm not for the public to hear this. Y'all don't apply. Y'all busy. Y'all do different things. It's usually the same people looking to get on with one single board. And it's really not, so I'm bound to it. So my peers know that, like, no, we, we sit here, like, well, where are they at? Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Are y'all board appointment ready? 
So it's a balancing act between us desiring to appoint people. We got to go like, okay, is anybody? I mean, who applied? You know, right? The county clerk. Has anybody applied? No, no, no. And then we're sitting here having to scramble, calling people. Can anybody be appointed? So that's important when sometimes you hear the, the political appointee thing. Well, if at large nobody's responding, well, we got to appoint somebody to the board. So you got to have a balancing act with that. So I'm just putting it out there. Is it something that we want you to take up now? I don't think it's worth stopping because um, you always amend legislation on and on and on. But at least for now, um, I'm okay with um, the window of time to, to sort of leave something open. But I, I'm still, I think if it's warranted, if not all the boards or committees, at least some of them should be looked at to make sure that they're district specific that local boards matter. So I'll leave it at that. It was just a commentary. Yeah, and I will say this on, on this, and y'all will see this, well, you probably can see it now. I don't think there's any comments about the methodology of, as far as districts or not. It's more the pool, and y'all, that may be something y'all want to discuss, right. Mr. Rons, because I don't know. Yeah. I think the history is more, there's been some informal, all right, you get appointment, you get appointment, the chair gets appointment, whoever, yeah. as opposed to, I don't know that there's anything actually documented that requires it. So y'all really drive that ship, yeah. however y'all want to drive it. That one's important. I'm, I'm okay with the other policies membership. That one I would like to at least, can we talk, separate the two in the vote? Mm -hmm. right. but, but also, uh, I don't want it to just be district specifically. You need at large input as well. And that kind of pushes me to the side and not allow me to have a voice and I need one. So with that being said, you need to make sure that at large has a voice. Well, well, on this particular policy, if y'all were to prove it, this is only the methodology and procedure of attracting candidates. Right. This does not specifically address they got to come from a district or they got to come from at large. That's that may, and I don't think we actually have a formal rule, do we? That's just one that in the past, here's what they've done, and that's what we picked up. I don't know that there's well, any I think formality. The, the animal, I know the animal control board. That some of them that does. So some of them may be, sp be specific in their legislation. And I think the planning and zoning. Mm -hmm. I think they are. They used it used to be documented that they were, but I don't think it has to be any longer. We've just always. Right. Those procedures. So, again, just for the sake of being consistent, bringing things forward, just like we're reforming these, you know, right. bringing them forward, we'd like to put, to Madam Chair's point, I don't want to separate, I want to separate the two. So I thought that was big enough for us to take it offline, um, but I'm okay with, uh, your point was, make sure we had a window of time that was appropriate for people to apply. No problem with that. My other point on the other ones, this is Jennifer um, Holman. Uh, we talked about in finance, and I just don't remember what, what, what we talked about as it relates to travel. We've gotten comments from employees, and just, just the things that we've aggregated over time as it relates to uh, the $35 per diem. Um, we talked about this in finance, so I at least wanted this to be a record. What was the amount that we sort of came to? I, I think I said let it go up. How do we handle that? I believe that's something 55. that's going to be brought up um, in the finance committee. It was going to be today, but the, the, the squalls and the travel policy got moved to tomorrow at 30 because Mark had to leave for a funeral. Um, but um, in the conversation, the answer your question, I believe it was $50 a day. 50 or 55 It was, it was tied to the federal. Yes. Was it 50? 50, 55. 55? 55. 55. Yeah. Can you just confirm for sure. us? Sure. Um, so, um, I wouldn't want that to sort of be law, to not be addressed as well since we talked about it in finance and we offered it up as a recommendation to the full board. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we can, I mean, so what are you saying? We're, are we tabling this? When you say it was going to come up in finance, but now we're not, what are you saying? No, it was, it's going to come up at the finance committee that we have scheduled, a special call meeting scheduled tomorrow at 830. Okay. So, uh, Jennifer, is that a policy? We have a reimbursement policy that's separate from all this as the actual schedule of what you can get for DMs and all that. Mm -hmm. I think what Commissioner is asking if the Finance Committee were to recommend changes to that, that would be yeah. separate from these three groups of things that are on the agenda right now. Correct. Because the schedule, this doesn't, this has caps on credit cards, but it doesn't have the actual schedule. Here's what your per diem for travel is, here's what your mileage is. Is that a separate policy that y'all have? that y'all could present under new business tomorrow to be taken up if that's going to be a recommendation of finance or what? It's, 
part of the travel policy that's, that's on here. Yeah, that's it's actually in the, the yeah. actual numbers are in here? Yeah. In, yeah. yeah, in the travel policy, the numbers are in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't realize the numbers weren't. I apologize. But Mark had suggested that we bring it up and for discussion with the finance committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that, okay. Today. Yeah. Well, it'll be tomorrow. That SPLOS and the travel policy will be tomorrow because Mark won't be here. Okay. He wants to be here for about that. Is. Curious thing, don't you? Can I just hold off on that until the finance committee? We're fine. Let's mm -hmm. wait till tomorrow. And then whatever comes out of that to the, the broader group, we'll bring forth as a recommendation. So. We want to leave it as is for right now, and whatever comes out of finance, will you guys be willing to no. to hear it or what? Mm -hmm. No, I heard no. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm going to go back. I made my point. <laughs> okay, and so I'm, I'm good. I mean, I made my point. So yeah, go. Okay, and also Jennifer, you were working on uh, budget impact to see exactly what happened once we change those numbers. Did you ever get that information out to us? I believe Jessica was pulling uh, yeah. all the sheets. I'll check with her as well. Just, just a, it, it just projected. Sure. Okay. And Madam Chair, there's one, one other thing I probably need to mention on the um, somewhere in here, I think it's the credit card user or credit card policy. We have a list of people who are approved as of the date of this. And it's under section eight, and uh, it's a, it's at the end. It's a, it's not complete. The list that's on here does not take into account the changes that y'all made recently when you opened up the other local elected officials. And uh, from Mark, the county. Uh, here's what I believe. I believe that there is Mark has a credit card, the county administrator, the county clerk has a credit card, and Matt Laverne has a credit card. I'm not aware of anybody else besides local government, local elected officials, and board eligible folks. Do y'all know of anybody else besides those? The fire department. Huh? The fire, fire department. department. We probably need to get that list so I can make sure that Section 8 is correct because at the time I didn't know who the other people were. Okay. So you're working on that? Yeah. yeah. And we can have that for tomorrow if you need. Tomorrow. Okay, please. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, thank you. Um, it, it just seems like these are, we're, we're fast tracking four policies and we're trying to get them aligned. I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to if, if should we table? Yes. And, and the only reason I'm asking, maybe not all of them, uh, more specifically the travel one, because it's something that we have, to, at least the, the per diem we talked about in a prior finance committee. $55, I just looked at that. Okay, so we talked about it. So it's not like it's a new recommendation that we got to revisit that. My point is that should be incorporated in this. That's my first point. And it was already talked about. All right. Um, well, at least made a recommendation. I can make you want to read exactly what the minutes say? No. Not we're good. Okay. No, no. I, I don't want to belabor it. Okay. But, but, but you will. But that one, just, just that one table to make sure we're aligned. I'm okay with the other ones. You got to clean up the legislation. Y'all should have. I mean, I got my kid was doing as far as the legislative. Um, and, and then the last one, which was about the board appointment. That's what I'm saying. These are four different things. I'm like, Okay, wait a minute, what did I just hear? So the travel, I would like to see that one tabled until we can really think about that one. The other ones I'm okay with, and then I'll let y'all talk about the board appointments. But I mean, we're trying to tackle all four of these at the same time. They're big issues though. We're handling them like they're just a little, small administrative actions. It's like, okay, y'all know what we're about to do here. So if you're gonna open this up, do it right. Don't, don't just slip this through. You got a window of time to clean this up and make it meaningful as it relates to legislation. Else, okay. Madam Chair, I'll, I'll I'll based on Commissioner Robinson's comments, if y'all are inclined, <coughs> I would probably table all three of them because them. Yeah. between between y'all, they're so interrelated that if we pass two of them yeah. and yeah, the don't pass yeah. or amend the third one, it may not make any sense in the books. Okay. Uh, so y'all can administratively table this now if you want to take it off and put it on the two weeks and we'll get it cleaned up between now and if we want to say. We, we'll take it off. Yes. We'll take it off. All right. Now right. just give us a little more time to clean right. it up. Okay. Do y'all also yeah. want to address the appointment policy now or you want it to Take, take them off too. Just okay. take them all off. Yeah. Clean them up and make them separate as okay. we present them. You know, I think one would be bundled. Bundled right. the credit cards and travel and all that. And then allow the two different. Um, yeah, two different. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So and we would ask it when you see your track versions. If you have any comments, let us know, please. Okay. Because I've sent all emails with the track versions, and I'll clean up the section eight about who's actually got a credit card, and we'll get with Jennifer Hallman. Jennifer Moore will get with Jennifer to make sure we got the right reimbursement 
schedule is being proposed, and it will be tracked so you can see it as well. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have two items left on this 12 and 13. It seems we can fix it up. We can probably talk about those. Tab number 12 is authorization to award a contract to Summit Construction and Development LLC in the amount of $663,872.80 for the construction of Doris Road and Sweetwater Church Road in the section improvement project to be funded from the 2016 SWAS funds with a 50% of a total cost contribution from Paulton County through a previously approved memorandum of agreement and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Thank you. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner, we, we are ready to uh, move into uh, construction award. Uh, the, the project was bid. We are recommending that the low bidder be uh, awarded the contract. They are uh, properly certified uh, to handle this type of project, and so we're ready to move forward upon uh, approval by the board. Okay. Any questions from the board? Self-explanatory. We, we, this, this is a recommendation coming from transportation, right? Yes, this item was uh, was reviewed mm -hmm. by the transportation committee. They made a recommendation for award. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to tab thirteen. Um, authorization to approve a construction funding agreement with DDOT in connection with the Maxim Road Improvement Project P one zero zero one two six. Uh, to one to facilitate the commitment of federal funds and allow GDOT to reimburse the county up to two million two hundred eighty thousand four hundred sixty four dollars and sixty four cents of project construction costs and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, yes, this one is the funding agreement. Uh, we have identified the low bidder on the project who is recommended to get the award once we are ready to do that. This agreement would have to go back to GDOT for them to execute. Then they will send us a notice to proceed to award the project, and we would be back before the board with an award to the low bidder at that time. Okay, any questions from the board? And you can see that this particular, um, this two meeting is broken up in increments. So can you? Talk about those various tiers, federal, where these dollars are coming from. Yes, th this was a, a, a project that was expected, or the estimate originally was 2.4 million, and uh, it came in at 2.8 million. And so, typically, uh, the local agency will have to come up with a difference. This is one where we appealed, uh, filed a request for additional funding with GDOT and they ran it up to Federal Highway and they were able to grant us uh, the additional funding. So they are covering 80% of the cost. Um, so that, that eliminated the, uh, the exposure that the county had for almost half a million dollars. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? We'll move on to tab number 18. I've already discussed the approval of expenses for tomorrow's uh, discussion item. Proposed annexation by the city of Douglas uh, Bill, Riverside West, and two, and it says Bob Arnold, Trey Lane, Preston Boulevard, Ron Roberts. Madam Chair, Commissioner, this is, uh, this is something we, that planning and zoning deals with from time to time. We do get annexation requests, but we've never you know, either I individually go to the commissioners or I just wait and see if there's anybody that's going to weigh in or have an objection to it. Um, and so we've kind of like just, this is an effort to formalize the process when we get an annexation request. So put on here as a discussion item um, and uh, included a, a report in your packet that outlines where, where, the, where the location is. Um, let me see. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just speak to it. Then uh, you have the maps the, in 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 your uh, should be in the civic clerk. But the, the address is actually uh, well, there are parcels um, that are off Riverside Drive and um, River Road and Sumer Lake Road. Yeah. It's 134 acres. One application. The, the 
proposed design is to go to light industrial. It's currently light industrial, so there's no real conflict from the zoning standpoint there. We also have um, an application off Pres Preston Boulevard with access to Trey Lane. It's currently light industrial and is going to be annexed into the city as a multifamily apartments. So, yeah. So I just want to make make sure our response, if we don't, if there's no objection to the annexations, is to to because it's such a tight time time tight timetable, we get uh, we'll prepare a letter to get it back to the city. Okay. Yeah, I just want to hear. All right, so these are two separate things, right? Right. All right, so the, the first annex, let's take them in reverse, uh, the multi-family. Um, uh, yes, 41.3 acres. Yep. How many units, roughly? Did, did 10 units per acre if it goes into the city. Yep. Okay, so that's tray lane. That's, okay, that's a lot. You got to put multi-family up there with all those trucks. Huh. All that congestion. Well, that's one thing we were talking about with staff commissioner. Bill was actually over at the city when this when they were pulling the zoning yeah. for this, and we know that the the residents in that area were concerned about it going light industrial and having traffic. And I don't know if that's what precipitated the annexation or what, but they the, the residents in the area preferred the multi-family apparently. I, I, I get it, but if the multi-family is going in there against all the. Yeah. 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 My point. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I get their annexation, so um, mm -hmm. all right, put that to the side. I mean, this I'm, I'm hearing this. I appreciate the discussion. This is good. Thank you, Juan. The other um, one about Riverside. Now, where's that? At? Where? Where? Go back to the map. Go back. Riverside. Right. That's further down. Right. You have to take River. Road by the uh, Gordon Foods to get to it. Yep, the parcels all in here. Got all it. in the woods. Back up over there. All right. So they want to put more multi. I mean, excuse me, light industrial. Yes. 130 some odd acres. 134 acres. Yeah. What can you put on 134 acres? Another million square feet? I'm not sure what the end. Probably, probably multiple. Right. Probably multiples. It's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. At this. But that's appropriate, not. But they're annexing our light industrial into the city. That's correct. <laughs> they're grabbing their cash. I get it. Uh -huh. Like I, I still challenge the, the thought that again, all we do is light industrial. I get the cash that provides guys, but it's like okay, there's no class A. I mean, it's just more of the same. Right? This density. As much as we talk about and go back to District Two, what this like? Look at this. It's density, right? And so while it, it, it does um, generate cash, um, it, it does add to the um, add to the to the digest per se because of the cash that comes in. It's not diversified, and um, all we're doing is putting volume. You're putting people, and you're putting trucks. It is what it is, but um, and so it has a right to make a claim against that cash in this area. But at the same point, I'm like, oh, more density. Now, again, the city is taking this. So, again, I understand, you, Commissioner Mitchell, you can help with you, your ex-city council. So they have that power. But it just, my, my objection is just, it's just I, my only objection is you can't come up with anything else. And I know it's already planned for that. I, I get it. But I have a problem with them. Like, well, I'm, I'm a no. Excuse me. Uh, on... I'm just no for the fact of that's enough. At some point, you got to know when, when's enough enough where you can begin to ebb and, and be creative. You can take that light industrial and, and, and repurpose it and put other stuff out there, but it's more of the same. So at some point, in the broader, I, I'm, I'm like, for the sake of just, I get it. I just think that that's enough. And at some point, you put a more, you just freeze, like, okay, go do something else. It will be nothing but trucks over there. And at some point, it's going to get built out. So don't get me wrong, this too is about to be built out. You're going to have to go west anyway. I mean, to grow, you're going to have to go west. So I'm less concerned with, and so I'm just, um, 
decelerating just enough, or at least to make the commentary to pause, like, okay, guys, can, can, you, can you top this off by doing something a little bit different? Can you be more, or is it just more of a, well, this is what's at hand, let's go ahead and just take it. And I get it, don't get me wrong, so it, it, it's more of a, the city is the city, and we're the county, and so my voice is just what it is, but I, I would object to it. It's not that I can stop it, but I can still object. Um, so I'll leave it at that. to Bob Arnold to... Is that not a truck injury yeah. in that area? Yeah, that's why the residents, that's why all of these residents were up in arms about us having light industrial in the county and putting another million square feet of light industrial truck traffic on their residential road. But th this is a multi-family project. This will now be a multi-family. It's already light industrial. He has all the permissions he needs to build another million square foot Why of light industrial. Why does he want to annex? So he can build apartments at 10 units an acre. When the city rewrote the code for the city, they added a, a, a planned residential district to the city code that allowed for unlimited residential development of some quality. You bring a project and we will give you a density and they have negotiated a density of 10 units an acre. But a lot of that is already, is, um, is what? Is heavy commercial, is it not? Was this heavy planned that? Up, up here is commercial, I mean that's on Thorn, Thorn Road, and that's your main commercial corridor. Yeah, and so we're, we're, we're creating another sweet water. <laughs> Uh, you know, where the subdivision was behind all the uh, heavier, uh, where the warehousing area, and they were complaining about they couldn't get in and out of their subdivision, and this, that, and the other. Is this not creating another situation? Well, it's not anything you're creating. It's what they would like to create within the city limits. I know, but I don't know whether if we say no, what what happens? Well, objection to an annexation, there's a process that goes in place and there's this is pretty, um, I mean, I, I talked to Mark about this, there's a, there's a guideline here, I'll just read them real quick. Um, the proposed change in zoning or land use, this is, it, you know, is it uh, in conflict? Um, it's not. Um, proposed increase in density, um, is, is, is it infrastructure demands, are there infrastructure demands that are going to be, that are going to be put on the county? Well, I think it's going to create more traffic problems. Okay. And that we're going to have to address down the road, just like we had to do when they built the subdivision back there and the other apartments. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a process. We have 30 days from, from the receipt of the letter which got here Friday to object. And um, if, that, if, that's, if that's something that y'all are wanting to do, then we would draft a letter for DCA. And they have to accept our reasons, and it has to be you know it has to it has to have uh, has to be couched in one of these. But, but that these area objections. right now has its own. Um, well, this, this, the area is all city. This is a city zone. Everything that these folks would be driving through is within the city limits. But they're wanting to annex. Right. That's that's down here, and what you have is one small connection to Trey Lane, yep. and then everything else, including this upper blue piece, which is part of his property, is in the city already. So he's asking to annex a portion, a small portion of this piece right here, 709, mm -hmm. to attach it to that and build apartments. So the one, the, the brown area, is that? The brown area is, is, is much higher density residential within the city. This is all city. 
All of this is even the brown. Probably. Even the brown. Yes. Your county okay. zoning, well, the county zoning is below it. I, I've separated the maps so you. Okay, can, I thought you were saying that yeah. they wanted to annex that brown area. No, they, this you're is. You're not saying that. Yeah, this is what they wish to annex. Just this blue and white striped area. This is already in the city. Okay. All of the residential density you're talking about is already in the city, mm -hmm. and this is also in the city, which is part of what he already owns as well. So when you look at the property, there's a small connection to Trey Lane. It was going to be 300 or so apartments. They're going to exit with a main entrance off Preston Boulevard. They're going to use Blair's Bridge, obviously, or Bob Arnold to get over to Thornton. So that's their travel lanes. That's their travel path. The fact that these folks here are probably madder than Dickens at what got built up here, which is a million square feet of light industrial. And so they would prefer to have residential apartments. That's what I kept hearing when I worked at the city. They'd rather have apartments in here than tractor trailers on yeah. Preston Boulevard. Yep. Mm -hmm. that, that's the main deal for them. But you, you know, this is our zoning. So what you're looking at is light industrial already. This is still within the county. The only thing that's leaving is this piece up here. They still own that piece. Mm -hmm. All of the slight blue. Yeah, they well they don't not this owner does not own all of this, but this is all light industrial, all of this, and all that's leaving is just this small piece up here, the 40 acres or so at the top. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna we're just swapping it out, multifamily for light industrial. The kinds of impacts are, it's not the same truck traffic and car traffic, but it's about the same impact if you start to look at the volume of of what it is or the weights of what it is. All right, it feels better now since you've explained it. Okay, yes. uh -huh. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. So, so the problem is that portion that you're speaking of. That's yeah. That portion is it that we don't have a ten units per acre? Correct. Right. No, right. there's six. Right. So, if by chance that was the case, then the possibility of this being annexed would have been we can do it in the county. Would have. Well, here's the deal. So what you need to understand about annexation and why this is attractive is because he gets to pick the zone district he goes into when he enters the city. You'd have to rezone this property from light industrial to be able to do multifamily. I get it. So now there's another process. Yeah. And, and the whole re -annex, uh, annexation laws have changed. And I don't know, Kim, one of you guys can kind of talk to that because it's, it's kind of the <laughs> process is totally different than what it used to be. So objecting. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, let me jump on that commission yeah. because, uh, you know, the DCA will put together an arbitration panel, we objected, and they accept our reasons for mm -hmm. the objection. But they, they really can't stop the annexation anyway. The, the most they can do is apply zoning or land use or development <coughs> restrictions to this land, which are only good for one year anyways. So that's that's the, the, that's what takes place there. So yeah, let me jump on that. The, the, the way that law is written, it's very pro uh, city. city. That's it's correct. pro city. Mm -hmm. uh, the way you go around it, typically, other than you can object and they'll tie it up, is you either negotiate with the city or you negotiate with the land, the applicant, mm -hmm. to to try to avoid it. And sometimes the applicant, if the applicant withdraws, it can't be annexed if they withdraw by a certain period of time. But that's really, so when you object to an annexation, you really need to look at doing the other piece simultaneously because all you're doing is slowing down the process, ultimately. Not stopping it up. Well, uh, however, so, so yeah. going back to my initial thought, and I'm just really saying it for right, right. my commissioners to say, if, if you're interested, then we need to look at our zoning. Uh, at the 10 acre, I mean, 10 density. per acre at the, density. at the density to decide on the annexation because the likelihood of that annexation being stopped is slim to none. That's right. Only thing you're doing is, as Ken stated, you can slow it up, but you, you probably won't stop it. And you all have had some input in that because you have a comprehensive plan. The That's city correct. and the county's comprehensive plan sort of identifies this area as a workforce center, a workplace center, or a right. commerce center. And so you have nice. anticipated a density going on exactly. there. And, and, and I would say this too, though. If that portion that we just talked about is, is going to be 
possibly annex, you can probably go down and, and you'll probably see now that the other portion down the road, not the one that's light industrial and hard blue, but the line now portion could be another possibility of some form of annexation and not the, the hard blue as well. You know, they try to build out what the city is trying to get out. Now, I do understand there's a double taxation in all of this too, though, so it ain't like, you know, they, they clearly get around no taxes through the county. It's just that they'll pay double tax. But I think if, if we make the adjustment to keep it within um, the county, then we have to look at our own ordinance, our zoning rather than our ordinance, our, our zoning to look at that possible 10 units because I, I don't think he or she, whomever this is, would make any, <coughs> would make that annexation happen if we had the zoning that he or she just created. That right. the city is all willing, all in to kind of deal with, and it sounds like the community is all for it. Mm -hmm. and, and our zoning is light industrial, is what they're not in favor of. Yeah. Correct. So, and, and, I, and I'm not saying to make the change, I'm only saying, you know, just food for thought, you know. And I want to say, and you may be able to, since you were at the city for a period of time, I think that subdivision filed suit. Wasn't there some litigation over this? Yes, sir. Yeah. Somebody filed suit in this area related to something. Yeah, well, the, originally this was going to be, it was going to look a lot like what you see here. It was going to be multiple buildings. And the truck traffic from this site, which is a huge building, uh, maybe 900,000 square foot building, is what's generating the traffic. They filed suit against those folks for that traffic problem and a number of other issues. But this, this is there. I mean, the truck traffic coming off of that warehouse is huge correct so and the only reason why i pointed that out commissioner was randy halsey uh mcgill's predecessor had to testify in that case he was subpoenaed and given a deposition mm -hmm. and a couple of, uh, maybe your predecessor ron also so we're on record with something i think i don't know what we're on record with but it's been a while it's been a couple of years ago mm -hmm. well i just want to make that you know so so at least this commission would understand. But duly noted, because after all, that could be a unified, a unified development code change Correct. that we could talk about later as we're doing our audit and our rewrite of the code itself as right. we go in the next year. Right, right. So, okay. Uh, I, I yield. Okay, thank you. One question. Right. You know, all that was in the CID, and it was for manufacturing mm -hmm. and industrial. Mm -hmm. And we, the infrastructure was placed in there for that purpose, and now they're deviating from that purpose. <laughs> it doesn't seem right. <laughs> of course, this is the property owner that's requesting this. Yeah. They have the property owner has to request the annexation. That's correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. And he had when he came to the city last year when I was the administrator, he had some sort of issue with his title that which is part of the SID, which is gave the property itself could not be modified. It had to go light industrial. There was some procedure they had to go through with their title um, and ownership interest to rid themselves of covenants that forbid it from being transferred from light industrial to residential. Well, my, my biggest problem is the traffic. They're already complaining about traffic. You're going to put all these... They, they're complaining about tractor trailers, but you're thinking about two houses, I mean, two cars per house. Yeah, it's in another. A residential area, at least, you know, it seems like uh, it's going to um, make it worse. Whoops. And then they're going to come to us and say, y'all got to do something about this road. Because it's, uh, we can't get in and out of our subdivision. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Can we not put a stipulation <laughs> that yes. they have to do? It's not city property right now. Right. I mean, what's going to happen is if it gets annexed, it's all going to be a city traffic study, and they'll identify what has to happen. Just so you can feel a little more comfortable, two of the things that what, what I had told them originally on this project was, first off, you have to use this little leg, this flagpole to get to Trey Lane. There has to be two entrances to but this. Trey Lane and I know it's warehouse. mostly warehouses. Yeah. But it'll be a secondary entrance for the apartment complex. So there'll be a gated entrance on that side. And the main entrance will be off Preston Boulevard. 
It's, th it's 300 apartments or it's a million square feet of tra water. tractor trailers? Yeah. Water. <laughs> <laughs> have people in trucks. I know it, but that the whole area was planned to be uh, industrial. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. And that went on for a decade, or uh, two decades. Really. Yeah. Okay. Just one more question. So you, you, you may have taken that one. Make sure I'm clear. So you, you actually talked with the city and or the developer or whomever that looking at a gated entry mm -hmm. on the backside of Trailey, mm -hmm. um, and they have agreed to that. Not that they have to, because that's whole that's solely a, a city project if it was annexed. Right. Before. I have no control over that's what exactly here. <laughs> okay. But when we worked there, when I was over there, oh, that gosh. was one of the uh, discussion items that we had. Was that there would there has to be a secondary entrance? It's too many apartments and a single entrance, bar, right. and so they would need a secondary entrance. Understood. And, and I, I guess when you said that, I thought maybe that's the discussion you oh, had with them no. recently. But this was some this years was last year. year. Last year, okay. So hopefully they'll, they'll at least because you can't control well, we can't control that mm -hmm. if by chance it was annexed. It, uh, we can't control that other than making that suggestion. But we got to decide on as a commission, preferably trucks. 18 wheelers versus 18 cars. You know, so you, you can decide on that. So it's more than 18 cars. Well, I, I'm being facetious. I'm not. <laughs> but but with that, that's that's what the determining factor because we could easily. I don't like to do what I call spot zoning to actually pull off something like this to say, make it available for them and not saying that they would or we would. You know, but. Am I correct in that statement? Wait, you're, you're the only okay. fly in that ointment is okay. that a piece of it's already in the city. That's correct. The northern yeah. parts are already in the city. So That's you correct. need the combined acreage to do the density. You're exactly and right. And part of this has a river flowing through it. It has the creek flow through the middle. And you can't build on that. So you right. wind up losing some of the land to Understood. open space. Understood. It's a requirement of development. Understood. Understood. So it's, kind of, it's a little more complicated than the map is actually showing. But we just want to make sure that you were aware. Here's okay. two annexations. Here's a process. We'd like to bring them to you from now on, so you are aware of what the city is being asked, asking of you, whose land into the city for a development and the change that the development would bring. And for, for clarity, the city will be responsible for that area. The city will. It won't be. Uh, the responsibility of the county. Well, other than the roads that Miguel is in charge of, which is by statute or by agreement until 2025, there are a few roads that the city will access, like Riverside, where another 300 apartment complex is going in, mm -hmm. where, again, Right, right, right. Those that, those that was yeah. doing the SDS that we did a right. while back, yeah, yeah. So, so, so those are the only roads, Miguel, that one, Riverside, and... and there's, there's a handful, but... Okay. The city would be in charge of whatever here, and the developer Correct. would have to be in charge of what's internal to this to site itself, obviously, and its connection to Preston. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, commissioners, we, we're going to just uh, omit the uh, committee updates today. We won't have those updates. However, I just encourage the, the um, directors to just have your your updates ready for our next meeting, and that that it be first. I'll go with the updates first. So, with that being said. Uh, do you have anything else? Yeah, just one, one point, and I, just on this, I don't think there was an ask, prior question, it wasn't an ask for this, this annexation, but I'm, I'm letting go of the multifamily um, apartments. I'm going back to 130 acres on Riverside. You're talking about um, the current, um, the, the FedEx across the street, the Cobb County right across the door is a million square feet. Think about split switch. A million square feet, how big that is. Um, uh, the, the area we're talking about right up there now, uh, T5, all of that, that's a million square feet on 30, 50 acres, say 50 acres. You're talking about 130 acres. You're talking about big, 2 million square feet. Y'all yeah, know what volume that is? Right. You're talking about Riverside. We're talking about that intersection of Riverside and Golden Road that keeps getting torn up just by the current volume. And so I'm, I'm Miguel, you know, the rebuild. Uh, what, what that takes. I mean, I mean you got to sometimes think through the impact of what we are responsible for. No, I can't control it. Yes, okay, I get it. But there's an impact to us that it's a cost that we have absorbed and they don't really have to absorb it. No. We do. So I just wanted to put that record back to while I'm like, okay, that's just, geez, two million square feet potentially dropped on there. 
in addition to the apartments that are coming? You talk about density, and so again, go back to transportation and the need to budget for maintenance, which is the daily maintenance, um, just for the record. I know, I, I keep spawning. But, but you're absolutely right, and, and I think this is when we'll go, is it next year or year after we get to the SDS, when we'll actually deal with that particular scenario exactly, because that's going to be a huge impact. You're absolutely right, because Yes, they, they got whatever small roads within there, but they, they got to get the Riverside trading and so on, which we are responsible for. So at the end of the day, that's when we start looking at that SDS scenario to kind of offset those kind of costs. But that will the, those two it. things yes. need to be tied together. That's yes. It. Future annexation yes. with responsibility for road and road. Well, I, agree. Right. I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, you, Agreed. You're on to something. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? Begrudgingly, with a happy <laughs> smile on my face, we need to go into executive session for real estate, litigation, and personnel. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. I'll take a motion. Motion and second. All in favor, please just keep our right hand. Take a 10 minute break. Okay, Board of Commissioners, uh, we are back on air and uh, we've had a very lengthy meeting and very we have any other questions, comments, or concerns? No, ma'am. Um, One thing. Commissioner Guider. I had a complaint from uh, someone uh, that lives off of Whitten Road, I think. And the logging trucks where they're cutting all these trees are going down there. And he, he says it's a designated no truck road, and they're tearing up the pavement. Oh, mm -hmm. What street is this? I think it's Britain. Road out in West and off of uh, Main Road. Okay, let me just have to. Well, our DLT team just told me to read. I do. You know somebody at the state that you can ask them not to cut you on our county road. Right. Okay. Because it's a long logging. So. Okay. And then I just have a quick update. I had an opportunity to visit Airplay Park and Billhop Park and Post Road Park and Winston Park. This week, those parts are definitely showing their age. Uh, there's uh, the two particular, which is Bill Art Park and the Fair Play, are um, 60 years old. So um, we have an opportunity to, to, to look at some things. The playgrounds were not, uh, they were substandard. I want to make sure we get those spruced up, and I'm working on a plan. And I'll bring that plan uh, forward to the Board of Commissioners. I know we have some other things that are related to the floss. But those playgrounds uh, for our babies, especially our little one and two year olds, uh, they deserve better. And they're just really old. I think they're about 15, almost 16 years old. So we just need to change them out. So I will be bringing a plan forward to the Board of Commissioners. Okay. With that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Adjourned. I'm saying adjourned. Adjourned. <laughs>